on. Okay, good morning everybody. Welcome to day three of budget hearings. It's June 19th, 2019, and uh, today we'll have our land use and community services. First, we'll start off with a presentation overview on uh, but on land service, land use and community services budget category as provided in the proposed budget, pages 227 to 229, for those of you following, following along at home, uh, and outlined in the memorandum of the CIO. Good morning, okay, good Chair morning. Coonerty, members of the board. Uh, Christina Mallory, your county budget manager. And so I'm gonna give you an overview of the land use and community services budgets today. Um, here you'll see a list of the departments and agencies including <laughs> land use and community services, agricultural commissioner, ag extension, our local agency uh, formation commission, LAFCO, library fund, uh, the Monterey Bay Air Resources District, uh, parks and cultural services, of course, uh, planning and our housing funds, public works, and our redevelopment successor agency. So here you'll see an overview of the total expenditures by department. Um, there's $203 million for this upcoming fiscal year. This represents 25% of all budgeted expenditures for fiscal year 1920. Um, it does represent an 11% decrease from the previous fiscal year, uh, primarily from the completion of several housing projects. Uh, and, and various other capital projects. Um, this chart shows the share of expenditures by department and agency, and you'll notice that the public works is the largest share at 71%. This will give you a, a picture of the types of expenditures um, over the next two years. Um, the largest, of course, is uh, services and supplies, um, which comprises about $92 million. Um, salaries and benefits, uh, $58 million. Uh, which support 414 plus positions, uh, which is an increase of almost two positions from the previous fiscal year. Additional expenditures include 31 million in other charges, uh, about 7 million in fixed assets, and 15 million, <coughs> excuse me, in other financing. Fiscal year 2021 expenditures are estimated to decrease by approximately 31 million, primarily due to the reductions in public works projects offset by status quo increases for existing staff and programs. The land use and community services category revenues are approximately 185 million um, next year, or 91% of the total financing, with the general fund and other funds making up the difference of approximately 9% to meet the expenditure needs. Uh, land use and community services finances represent 24% uh, of the budgeted uh, county revenues. And this chart shows the share of financing by department and agency. And you'll note that Agricultural Extension, LAFCO, and the Air Resources District are not represented as they are totally supported by the general fund. Sure. Um, the redevelopment number, uh, mm -hmm. given that we're not selling any more bonds, we're closing down the agency, what, com what, what makes up that 9% number? Primarily that's the, the actual debt service. Okay. Uh, and again, Public Works is the largest share at 74%. Here you'll see the uh, revenues over the course of the next two years. Um, uh, 84 million in charges and for services is the largest share. Uh, 47 million in intergovernmental revenue from federal and state sources. 32 million in taxes. 23 million in other revenues, including licenses, permits, miscellaneous uh, fees, and uh, and interest. Um, in 2021, revenues are estimated to decrease by approximately 25 million, primarily due to the completion of public works projects offset by minor increases in charges for services and taxes. And estimates will be updated as more information is known in the following year. Here you'll see the actual general fund contribution by department. Um, it's approximately $9.6 million. Uh, which represents about 6% of the total general fund net county cost, and further details are provided in each department budget. And you'll see here that uh, parks makes up the majority of that, 50%. Then I'd like to give you a few um, 1921 uh, operational plan highlights. Uh, the land use and community services departments contribute 51 objectives to the 1921 operational plan. Major projects include the creation of a campus master plan, completing Leo's Haven playground at Chanticleer Park, 
and updating the sustainability element of the general plan and a major collaboration to create a one-stop permitting center for county development services. While there is significant progress needed in infrastructure and deferred maintenance on much of our facilities, we want to acknowledge just a few of the accomplishments of the land use and community services uh, this year. From new public education programs around waste management and reduction, to innovative new planning tools for increasing housing units through overlay districts, from completing the new Mosquito Lab, to, uh, breaking uh, ground on several high-impact community projects such as Chanticleer Park, Leo's Haven, and the Felton Library. Our land use departments continue to work to protect uh, the health, safety, and wellness of Santa Cruz County residents. The largest of the land use and community services departments will provide presentations on the regular agenda today, and the status quo budget proposals are included on the consent agenda for the Ag Commissioner Ag Cooperative Extension, LAFCO, the Library Fund, the Monterey Bay Air Resources District, and the Redevelopment Successor Agency. Department heads and representatives are available here today to answer any questions you may have. And that concludes my presentation. Great, thank you very much. We have uh, one revision um, today's agenda on item 34. There's additional materials, revised supplemental pages 37 and 38. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now it's an opportunity for uh, action on our consent agenda. These are items 37 through 43 on, our t on today's agenda. Uh, first I'll ask if there are any uh, questions by supervisors. I just have a comment. Um, on item uh, 39, the library fund. Uh, again, I think it's proper to uh, thank the voters uh, for supporting the libraries on the, at the ballot box. Uh, it's allowed for rebuilding and renovating uh, library facilities throughout the county. Um, I look forward to the, and especially for the Felton Library opening early part of next year, and, and then shortly thereafter, the Boulder Creek Library starting uh, renovation uh, right after that. Uh, and I want to thank our library uh, director, Susan Nimitz, and our friends of Santa Cruz Libraries uh, groups for their efforts on behalf of our library system. Uh, they've really had a focus on it, obviously, and uh, it's made it, it's going to have a much better system in the very near future. And on the library fund, I, I see that uh, we've added five full-time positions, and half of those are going to go to the Felton Library. Uh, that will require... Uh, funding into the library fund balance for two years, but after that, uh, I'm glad to see that we'll continue with the maintenance of effort that we'll get. But uh, I think that the uh, people of Santa Cruz County have made a bold statement that they really appreciate their libraries and uh, appreciate it very much for their support at the ballot box as well. Great, thank you, and agreed. Um, are there any public comments on the consent agenda? project manager for Santa Cruz County Parks. And uh, as you will note, that my position's being eliminated from the parks budget. And I think there's perhaps some facts and information that- um, Ma'am, I just wanna, I think you're up next in item number 34. This oh, is- I'm sorry. This is the consent agenda. Oh, okay, I was thinking that was on the consent. I'm sorry. No problem. Okay. Hi, good morning, Board of Supervisors, community members. My name is Lori Chamberlain, and I'm the superintendent of the Live Oak School District, and I just came to speak and to support the uh, board's decision, hopefully, to approve the permit fees for the Live Oak uh, soccer field. Uh, this is something that's been in the Thank works. I'm sorry, you're up next as well. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, no problem. <laughs> we'll get there, <laughs> promise. <laughs> okay. Uh, Oh, we, 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 the Ag Commissioner, <laughs> you are on here. Uh, good morning, Chair, members of the board, Juan Hidalgo Agricultural Commissioner. I just want to take a minute to uh, thank your board and the CAO's office for all their support of our agricultural programs and the Mosquito and Vector Control Division. Uh, and also I want to thank my staff for uh, their incredible work and commitment to provide excellent service to our community. Um, and uh, we look forward to uh, continuing to provide uh, good service and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for your good work in our community. Okay, that concludes public comment on the consent agenda. I'd entertain. I have one comment. Oh, sorry, yes. Please. Hi, my name is James Williams. Uh, I represent uh, Friends of Quail Hollow, 
And I have two very quick items. I know you guys are gonna be very busy today. Um, Sorry, uh, sir, I think you're next as well. The parks next. is coming up next. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're on the consent agenda. <laughs> All right, uh, so that closes public comment and we'll bring it back to the board for deliberation action. I move the consent agenda. Uh, okay, so a motion by Leopold, a second by McPherson. And with just one brief comment on, in regards to the Ag Commissioner, I recognize that uh, we talk a lot about planning in regards to cannabis, but there's a significant increase in the workload facing his department as well, and with the world of hemp coming on, I think it's something that the board's gonna have to consider as we uh, do intake funds associated with cannabis cultivation and the CBT, we, we're gonna need to seriously look at how his staff is impacted as well, and whether we need to make adjustments to that in the coming year's budget. Thank you. So we have a motion by Leopold, a second by McPherson. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Now we're on to item number 34. This is the parks. Uh, consider the 2019-2021 proposed budget for parks, open space, and cultural services as outlined in the reference budget documents and schedule the proposed continuing agreements list and amendments to the unified fee schedule for a final approval on last day budget hearings, 20, June 25, uh, 25th, 2019, as outlined in a memorandum of the Director of Parks, Open Space, and Cultural Services. The much anticipated uh, parks much anticipated, budget, it sounds uh, like. Goodie bags, and, thank uh, you. As you're getting those, I wanted to highlight that uh, on that it says Love in the Hollow, so we'll be talking later about a free month in July because it is National Parks and Recreation Month, but uh, we'll be doing free weddings all day on July 14th at Quail Hollow, so that's why you have Love in the Hollow on that bag. And then inside it, you also have um, a uh, sheet like this that will tell you about all the fun events in July that we'll be having for free. And uh, that's also gonna be talked about a little bit later. So, Chairman Coonerty and fellow supervisors, thank you for having us here this morning. We'll start through uh, our Parks Department budget. For, let's see, there, there we go. Oh. Page, down. Page down, okay, thank you. All right, there we go. So for the highlight, we're gonna be going over um, we have the overview, our grants, upcoming projects, parks objectives, <laughs> challenges and opportunities, and partnerships and special events. For the highlights in 18, 19, uh, those are actually all supposed to be boxes that are checked actually, so sorry about that. Um, those are things we accomplished. The Act Net Recreation Software, Aldridge Improvements, Chanticleer is actually under construction. Uh, the Coastal Encroachment Program actually implemented and we have permits on file. Uh, Davenport Landing's actually out to bid. Heart of Soquel, phase two and three are funded. Hidden Beach Improvements, Measure G successfully is passed, which is thank you to vo voters and everybody else's support on that. The new concessions, um, we've started to get those up and running for summer. And the Pinto uh, pump track completed. So down at the bottom, I'm not sure. I'm gonna still look. Oh yeah, and then we've added some special events for the year several special events, ones that we're both partnering with and sponsoring. As we look at the uh, overall budget, um, the biggest impacts are gonna be uh, in regards to utilities and especially water costs. They have gone up significantly, um, as much as 25%. Um, and we're also looking at the three additional positions we added as a result of Measure G. So um, one of those was an unfunded maintenance worker position that we had and we funded that. We added a maintenance worker position and then also a, a park and rec specialist position program specialist. Um, so the changes, as I started to highlight, um, existing staff costs, um, that's the biggest impact with utilities. Those are the two issues that probably hit the budget the hardest. Uh, measure G um, additions also, which were anticipated and um, compensated for with Measure G dollars. Uh, our mid-year change in planning, which um, is a position uh, that we're gonna switch from project manager to a planning position, that'll save us about 100, almost $100,000 in the first year and then almost 200,000 each year after that. So utilities, um, as we mentioned, and then internships, we're looking at expanding our internship program. We have a, a we're working with Lead for America on one of those. We're working with AmeriCorps, of course, um, similar to internship internship programs. But we're really going to get down into um, meeting with each university that surrounds the area, even going over over the hill and and down into Monterey County, and develop a very solid internship program so we can look at uh, increasing our workforce over the future. Um, special events, as I mentioned, we're continuing to partner and or sponsor large special events throughout the county. 
continue to do our outreach. Um, we've increased the, we've doubled the size of our emailing list and um, doubled the size of our, our Instagram account um, followers and Facebook. Those are all things that we'd like to um, be able to get information out in a more 21st century type of way. And then the last thing, the storm repairs that we have, um, we're wrapping up the last of those, believe it or not, it's taken a couple of years and we may still see some of those in the budget. So the changes for 2021, I'm um, sorry if I didn't highlight before, that was for uh, uh, 1920, uh, this is 2021 now, keeping in mind that we're having a two year budget. And just, if anybody catches me say the word exciting, I just want you to know, um, I, my staff is gonna make me pay $5 each time, so you guys want my own to keep tally on that. I get a little overly excited about the budget, so I'm really doing my best not to use that word. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so anyway, as we move forward, um, we're gonna add a, a, a quarter time to uh, a rec specialist position that'll be um, offset with increases in revenue. And then the utilities we're gonna worry about, again, uh, they continue to skyrocket on us and we're doing everything we can to uh, modify the way we do business and, and find ways to do things in a more effective and efficient manner. Okay, so some of the increasing revenue to offset the expenditures. Uh, we already talked the coastal encroachment program um, and then concessionaires, those are, um, we're finding great success with that throughout the, the county, um, finding new ways to do concessions. Um, we're also gonna expand our rental opportunities, um, possibly more weddings and looking at areas that we didn't in the past, weren't able to uh, reserve for picnics and or group uh, reservations. We're looking at the potential to increase the CSA 11 revenue. Um, it's $8.50 a parcel right now. We also uh, are looking at park impact fees. Um, we haven't really looked at those in, in over 20 years and uh, they need to be examined. So improve utility consumption as we talked about in alternative options. And then we're looking at um, a r continuing to reorganize and reclassify positions as needed. So grants, as you can see the last couple of years, um, we were looking at under a million dollars in grants, well under a million dollars a couple of years ago, and now um, regularly hitting a million or more each year um, with the passage of Prop 68 and the implementation of, of the available grants through Prop 68, we probably will be looking at anywhere between eight and $11 million a year for the next couple of years as potential grant opportunities. So we definitely wanna jump on those. Um, we also have uh, contracted and we'll be contracting with a grant writer and um, I think that's the best strategy we have for looking at that. Um, so upcoming projects, uh, I would normally use the word exciting here but I'm not going to, so I don't know, is, that, is, is saying the word exciting, uh, I may have to pay five bucks for that one. I, I've counted three so far. Yeah, I know, <laughs> thank you. All right, so we're gonna fix this budget problem right now <laughs> out of my pocket. Um, so it is nice to see uh, over the last couple of years to really have brought all these projects forward and see the fruition of our, our work. Um, the Felton Nature Discovery Park, all of these will either be starting construction or um, become fully funded and um, looking at getting plans drawn up. Hardest Hotel, Seacliff Village Park, um, adding a restroom, Davenport Landing, actually replacing the restroom. Um, Live Oak Library Annex, um, and also some of the associated deferred maintenance issues that go along with that, um, which is also the Sim Simpkins Family Swim Center. So we have a lot of 20 year old problems there that we're gonna be able to work on. The Farm Park, um, which has been a long, com long time coming. Very exciting to get that, oh, I got, there's another one. Uh, to get that underway. Uh, Hidden Beach, we have some improvements still to complete. We did ADA and now we're looking at the playground. And then Quail Hollow actually uh, getting some repairs to the structure up there so we can keep it in tip top shape. Um, so looking at the cop county operational plan park objectives, we um, did our own strategic plan and got our own operational plan together as the parks department and now we're uh, melding that with um, the county's overwide operational plan and we found uh, six different opportunities to do that. Um, so as you look, we really are hopeful that um, by June of 2021 actually, we're gonna create a, our new rec camp for preteens and teenage youth. This is a, a an age group that um, is underserved in our county and needs to be targeted and provided uh, opportunities to attend uh, camps where they can develop skills and self-esteem. So um, also we're hoping by 2020 that parks will complete the construction of Santa Clara Park Phase 1 and Leo's Haven Playground Project. I think that's very realistic at this point considering that I saw the restroom going down the street today actually. So that's really nice, um, not exciting. 
So, uh, and then uh, 2021, we're gonna complete the s uh, swim center deferred maintenance issues that we talked about. There's a lot of um, over a million dollars at least in deferred maintenance issues that we need to take care of there. So uh, definitely on our, our um, radar and something we're moving towards. As we look towards uh, December of 2020, we also wanna develop an internship program that gives st the students the opportunity to uh, learn our park functions, not just the typical park functions, but there's so many other opportunities for people to come and uh, learn about parks and government in general. So we're really, as I said, looking forward to expanding our, our opportunities with uh, local universities. And uh, by 2020, in June of 2020, we're also gonna work on our metrics for the maintenance section. In other words, um, we currently have four reporting locations, five reporting locations, and where people go, depending on traffic and how they get to different parks as they report to those locations can be very challenging, as we all know, with traffic in the area and just uh, schools and all that sort of thing. And so we're looking at how they can more efficiently and effectively get their work done and navigate some of the obstacles that are there every day, in addition to how they can improve efficiencies in the workflow all day. So. Um, this was also a Primo project. Uh, really um, looking forward to seeing how that comes out. And then we're also going to work on improving our community outreach. This is something that is very important to me and, and something I've wanted to do from day one, and that is regular surveys of our park users in the community so we know um, that we're hitting the marks we need to with them, that we're delivering the services that they're asking for. Um, and we hope to increase our social media followers by 25% um, by June 2020 as well. <clears throat> Some of the things we're looking at that are both challenges and potential opportunities, because as we all know, a challenge is always an opportunity. The deferred maintenance in our parks department, um, as we are aware and I've talked about in the past, um, there were years and years where there was no maintenance being done, no deferred maintenance being handled, and so catching up on that is an exponential number oftentimes, and we still are looking at how we um, approach that and how we are able to accomplish some of those issues around the deferred maintenance. Homelessness, we all know that is a huge problem for um, our county, our region, and our, our state, and, and really to some degree our country. So um, we are working um, diligently with all the other parks departments and often with other agencies to see how we can improve the opportunities uh, for the homeless that we do have living in our parks and or that we interact with. We've also trained our staff on how to interact with them. Um, we'll continue to do that. Hazardous tree removal, always uh, uh, an issue for a parks department. Um, but we did have a significant um, event that happened down at Moran Lake, and I think that um, is a focal point for us, and I've got pressure from the Planning Commission as well to address that. Um, as often happens, the natural resource protection collides with our urban interface, and so we have an issue where we have um, a butterfly habitat and, and trees that have a potential hazard, so I think that's, um, uh, an example of things throughout our county park system where we do have trees like that. And so um, sometimes one, uh, one tree alone can be $100,000 to deal with and removal and, and uh, disposal. So just a challenge to look forward to and how we get there. Um, youth programming, we don't have enough of it and we'd like to have the opportunity to provide more and how we come up with funding and how we come up with positions to do that is, is a challenge, but our youth are underserved when it comes to recreation in the unincorporated areas. Um, the park impact fee study, um, uh, bringing that to uh, this board and um, getting approval and uh, making sure that we are uh, balancing a delicate process is going to be a challenge, but it's also a great opportunity for us to get um, up to speed to where we need to be. Um, CSA 11 assessment increase, uh, that's definitely a, a potential opportunity for us to bring in more revenue to get us off of the dependency we have on the general fund. Right now, about 40% of our budget is general fund, and as you saw the slide, in the land, um, in land use department area, we are 50% of that. We'd like to get that down. Um, and then park master planning development. Uh, a lot of times parks departments start with a master plan and then they build the parks. Um, we're kind of doing that in reverse, but um, we'd like to see that we get at least a master plan down on paper and we can move from there. 
So some of the partnership highlights, uh, this is only a small portion of all the folks that we are partnered with at this point, um, and some of them are here today, I saw in the audience, um, and I definitely w wish I could highlight all of them. Um, one in particular I wanted to mention was the Santa Cruz Mountain Stewardship Network, which is made up of, at this point, 29 different organizations, um, most of them government agencies, some private um, entities like Big Creek Lumber, um, and also from two different counties, Santa Cruz and San Mateo County. It's a, a very robust organization that um, ties us into a, a, a very helpful and uh, beneficial network. Uh, Land Trust of Santa Cruz uh, County is one of the partners in there as well. So special events, as I mentioned, um, these are all events that we're either fully sponsoring or partnered heavily in with, and uh, we have increased them each year, and we continue to look for opportunities to do that. Typically, these are uh, fundraising events that uh, go to our local youth, um, oftentimes scholarships for them to participate in recreation programs or aquatic programs, um, or sometimes it's just fun to have a, a family movie night. So as I mentioned, there's your, um, all your free events um, that we're gonna be doing in July in honor of um, Parks and Recreation Month. I do think it's important to mention that this is a partnership with the City of Santa Cruz Parks Department, the City of Watsonville Parks Department, and Boulder Creek Recreation and Park District, and the, to some degree, uh, Capitol uh, Rec folks are helping out as well. So um, I think that in itself is a, is a huge benefit, and we will culminate, although it does go all the way to the 31st, I'd say the big culmination of this will be on the 27th, where Family Fun Day is gonna be at Harvey West. Um, so with that said, I'll say thank you, and I'll also back it up to that last slide so people can see that. I think I'll back it up. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. <coughs> thank you so much. Um, so let me ask if there are any questions. Yeah, so I thank you. I, I just want to say uh, there's been a revival in the County Parks Department, uh, cultural services and open space, and uh, I'm excited about it. It's really, it's really, <laughs> really, really great. Uh, it might cost you five And I want to thank, uh, and uh, you, if you want to know where that excite excitement comes from, just look no further than uh, Jeff Gaffney, the director. And thank you for your enthusiasm, your foresight, and your leadership, and everybody in the Parks Department staff. Uh, it's truly great. This has been, uh, our county parks, uh, because of some uh, re recession, um, oriented uh, issues that we had, it, it's uh, suffered the consequences for several years, but now we're, uh, there's, like I said, a revival of sorts, and it's really great to see that. I'm, I'm really grateful to the voters of Santa Cruz County in 2016 to, for passing Measure S, uh, or Measure G, excuse me, um, which uh, was critical in, um, for initiatives such as the Felton Discovery Park next to the Felton Library. Um, Unfortunately, it looks as if uh, some bids have come on very high for that, but uh, we'll have to deal with that as we go along. Um, and also, it, uh, the three additional uh, employees that you have, it's absolutely necessary if we're to continue our effort to improve the offerings of the Parks Department. Um, I appreciate the progress we've seen in the recent years, as you have mentioned with um, the uh, Highlands Park in my district, uh, the, the, uh, the, jump, the pump track in District 4, and Leo's Haven, especially in District 1. Uh, that was quite a, uh, a stirring opening that we had uh, a couple months, several months ago now. And I'm really excited also about the internship program and AmeriCorps, and I see Linda Skeff out there. Uh, she gets them to come back year in and year out, and uh, it's just fantastic what they have been able to do up in the San Lorenzo Valley in particular, but I know throughout Santa Cruz County, and I think that's gonna be a tremendous benefit, not only for the services and the opportunities it provides, but for the hands-on that these people that are involved with the AmeriCorps uh, put into it. They're great young people, and throughout the, United, throughout the nation, it's really great to meet them and, uh, and share their enthusiasm. They really like it. So I, hats off to uh, Linda Skeff and, and others who are so much involved in that program. It's been terrific. Um, and I, um, I think that we need to, you're right, we need to look at a more reliable funding stream. Um, with that, with, with Prop 68 that you had mentioned, uh, do you see, um, how, is there anything we can do to make our applications for projects more competitive, or uh, how, how are we set to move forward and possibly get some funding from those grants that you had showed in your chart? 
I think um, that both the contract grant writer that we, were br we brought on board and the fact that we are looking at how we can expand our fees, whether it's CSA 11 and or impact fees, those are areas in where we can generate revenue to uh, potentially match uh, those grants that we need to. Um, and so I also think that um, our staff has be developed uh, really good relationships with a lot of the grantors, and so I think that helps as well. But in the long term, we probably need to develop um, more uh, revenue in the future. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for your leadership and your excitement. Thank I you. Appreciate <laughs> it. Thank you. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. You know, Parks uh, Department is, is sort of our most interactive uh, department with the community in which the, there's so many great partnerships. Uh, we've seen that in so many different ways. Um, people contribute uh, to the parks and uh, the fact that we're uh, that we're seeing the construction of Leo's Haven Chanticleer Park is a great example of a community coming together to support parks in such a significant way. Uh, uh, I'm very excited about the activity uh, in our park system. Um, you mentioned Leo's Haven, which is is critically important, and, and I go by there every day and look at the progress that we're making. Um, in the plant fund, it had the Heart of Soquel Park, which um, I'm grateful for the staff support to, to, to get the grants um, to help complete that, uh, that park. Uh, but uh, nowhere did I see anything about the farm park. And when you were here a couple weeks ago talking about we're trying to get something done by the end of this year. What's going to happen with the farm park? Uh, we are um, going to be somewhat dependent on being successful with a grant. If uh, we are going to apply for that grant in August, and that is going to um, be where the majority of the funding will come. But the funding that we have currently will pay for us to get to the design and potentially construction phase. So, but if we're actually going to construct anything additionally besides what we talked about in regards to the pump and or bike track, which is the, the biggest piece, we will need help from the community members who stepped forward and said they would be willing to do that. So if we do not get the grant, then we would only have that available to us, the, the folks who've stepped forward and said they would help us build the pump. With the bike, bike. Uh, yep. uh, the bike uh, piece we yes. get done this year. Absolutely. Great, great. Um, uh, I, I see uh, the namesake of uh, the Simpkin uh, Pool Complex, Bill Simpkins here. Uh, he's here for, he has been very generous and helped uh, name uh, the pool. And we, one of the, uh, this year's, um, uh, in the operational plan is that we're going to do a lot of deferred maintenance. And I'm wondering if you could talk about when you see that happening, how long it, will the pool be clo closed, how will it affect revenues? Sure. Um, we, we hope that the pool will be closed no more than three months. Um, it will impact revenues. Um, we'll try to do it in the slowest portion of the season. Um, we have already met with and, and have met with regularly and continue to meet with the City of Santa Cruz. University system and and also uh, Cabrillo on opportunities of where we can send people who want to swim elsewhere. Uh, we could provide staff and or uh, support and allow that to be an alternative opportunity. Um, and so uh, yes, it will impact revenue and it will also uh, displace some of the the folks that go there on a regular basis. We do anticipate giving them plenty of notice and plenty of opportunities. Um, it actually. It may turn out to be uh, more beneficial in the end because we are encouraging the city of Santa Cruz to get Harvey West up and running again. It has been used in a very limited fashion. Um, and so making that available year round would be helpful because as you probably are aware, um, Simpkins actually parking lot fills up these days um, on a sunny day and never, I don't think, well, some people in the room may have anticipated that it would be get used as much, maybe you yourself, but uh, a lot of people when it was built didn't ever anticipate it would be used as much as it is. So as we look to the future, we probably do need to look at other opportunities for swim centers and or places for people to participate in swimming. Great. Well, I, is, uh, do you expect that that, that uh, work will be done in 2020 or 2021? We are hopeful that some of the work will be done in 2020. We actually um, just are looking at finally buying, buying some boilers, um, which um, the 20 year old boiler that has kept going and going and going is on its last legs. That in itself was about $120,000, I think. Um, 
And so that's one of the big items. Um, we have to drain the pool, replace the stucco. Um, those are all items that we would like to see coincide with the library annex construction so that all of the folks that come there on a regular basis won't be impacted over the course of three months here and then three months there if we could do it all at the same time. So that being said, we're looking at November, the second or third week in November for the library annex construction to start. So that's potentially where we could that's get the November work done. November 2020? Yes. Okay. Which also, as I said, works well for us in regards to the slowest time of the year for us at the swim center. Okay. Well, I hope you'll keep us up to date uh, about that. Absolutely. That'll be a big impact. That's a beloved community institution. And both those additions, the, the library addition and, the, um, uh, and uh, fixing the pool become really important. Um, associated with that is uh, um, I'm glad to see and I want to thank uh, our county administrative officer, uh, you as the parks director, um, and the great community support to help build the shoreline uh, soccer field. Um, that's, uh, uh, Bill had a great vision about how to have an all-purpose field that could be used um, uh, by uh, kids and families all year round. Uh, as many hours a day, and I think it really adds to um, just the community senator of Live Oak uh, will be in, in, in the area, and I'm glad that the county could participate in a small way in terms of waiving the fees um, uh, for the project. Uh, it was, uh, I was there for the, uh, the groundbreaking, and uh, there were a lot of great donors. There's a lot of excitement in the school district, and I think this is continues to uh, help support families in uh, Live Oak uh, in such a big way, and, and the soccer field will actually help um, uh, the whole mid-county uh, because there will be so many families who will be using it. It's going to it's going to cost me five dollars, but I'm going to say I'm excited. Okay. <laughs> Cha ching. Uh, the uh, smart downs. park maintenance uh, that uh, you also have as an operational goal. Um, do you reach out to the colleagues over in public work because they have an asset data um, database and is there a way that the, to use that system to support what you're trying to do uh, in parks? Yeah, our uh, superintendent who's in charge of that project has been working with public works and uh, we looked at many different models and ultimately uh, we do have a very unique operation in parks and, and we may be able to use some of the tools they have, but um, what we're doing right now is um, the first step in many. So as we get further into the process, we may access some of the tools they have. Okay, great. I mean, I think it's a great opportunity to build on something that we already use that, yep. that is uh, successful. Lastly, I'm looking forward to uh, the doing our first Live Oak uh, free movie night uh, this coming Friday. Yes. Hoping all the equipment's ready to go. Yes, uh, <laughs> definitely, uh, finally. But come out uh, Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. Exactly, uh, Felt Street. Friday at Felt Street Park. Yep, exciting. So, thanks for your work, uh, thanks for everybody's <laughs> contributions to help make parks successful. And uh, it goes back to 2014 when we did, uh, when we were able to uh, reestablish parks as a uh, independent department because of Measure F. Yep. Um, uh, 2016, they s supported Measure S for the libraries and in 2018 uh, parks were a big part of the success the uh, success of measure G so people love the parks thank you supervisor Brown <coughs> thank you chair thank you parks for all of your work uh, especially considering it was a department that that had very few resources leading up until the last couple of years still has not been built up to the point of before the recession like so many departments here at the county and, and speaking of that, I had, I had a question. I appreciate the priorities that you work with every uh, supervisor here to help uh, establish those priorities for each district. And one of the things that, that I have noticed, and, and Mr. Simpkins is, is actually a, a model of this, is that there are community members, there are private entities that are looking to invest in the parks. And I want to ensure that, uh, that the parks department is really prepared either through uh, a local nonprofit, or maybe you see a different model to actually accept these funds and find a way that we can construct things as a result of that. So I guess my question for you is, is there anything in the coming months or the coming year that, that you could bring forward that would make it easier uh, for the community to directly get involved in a way, uh, be, it a, be it a naming component, be it where people can invest in specific things, be it uh, elements at a certain park that people may want to purchase outside of just we have the bench program, et cetera? or maybe something even larger if somebody's looking to come in. Um, as was done in Capitola, for example, uh, 
you know, uh, Mark Monty had worked uh, a deal with the city of Capitol that in exchange for the fireworks, you know, and the money that was associated with it, and he built one park, he's trying to invest in another one. It just seemed like there wasn't an easy mechanism for somebody to do that in the same way. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that for the county park system. Yeah, I, uh, I would believe that as we've seen the county park friends organization uh, develop and grow over the last couple of years, um, and most recently, we adopted an MOU with the board, um, a, a very specific MOU. I think we can do an addendum to that. I think we should be doing an addendum. We're looking at, um, I think to some degree, we wanna make sure they're prepared to deal with that level of uh, donation, that level of um, specific specificity and also um, complexity. Um, so there's a lot of nuances that need to be in place. And there are several models around the state and even in our region that we can use. And we also are a unique county, as everybody likes to highlight. Um, so it, to your point, I, I absolutely want to do that and we will do that and we need to do that. And I think it will take some uh, further modifications of the MOU we, ha we have with County Park Friends and also um, probably uh, working with County Council and uh, working with this board. but. I think that's very doable within the next six months to, to have something much more substantial than we do now in regards to those types of donations, those types of cooperative agreements um, and private donors. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, we have a lot of land that we don't use at, at parks or we have phases that haven't been completed. In the, in the case of the master plan, for example, at the polo grounds, I mean, it took 30 years to get a bathroom in. Right. Um, in, the, in the case of, of Seacliff Village Park, I mean, we've we've, haven't even finished the first phase technically, but there are multiple phases that still need to be done. But you have people that are willing to invest in it, and I wanna ensure that we're not providing any block right. uh, to that. I mean, because I think that we've got parks that, that could actually fulfill their need if, if we had a way, an easy mechanism for people to contribute and be able to do it. And so if you see those ways, I, I encourage you to bring those forward to the board if things need to be modified either at the ordinance level or any kind of policy and procedure level, let's make sure that we, we do do that. Okay. I appreciate the work Absolutely. Thank you. Supervisor uh, Caput. Thank you. Yeah, there's uh, th thanks for everything you're doing. And uh, the big difference between uh, what 2015 and right now, yeah. uh, you could just look at uh, the chart and uh, it's really exciting to see that we're able to actually do something right now. Yeah. And uh, um, so, uh, w you know, uh, beach access is, uh, always comes up. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of always surprised, uh, you know, we're uh, taxpayer money pays for all the, you know, roads that lead to neighborhoods, uh, pol uh, police uh, sheriffs and uh, fire respond. That's all paid for by taxpayers in, at large. And then uh, we can go on maintenance leading to and from uh, neighborhoods. And when a neighborhood uh, shuts off access to a beach, they're basically saying we're gonna take advantage of all the taxpayer money leading up to our neighborhood. And the argument uh, that crime rates will go down in their neighborhood because they shut it off, uh, well, that, that's true with any neighborhood. If my, if my area in Watsonville uh, shut off access to our neighborhood and you had to get a key in there, um, we'd basically just, you know, telling the public, uh, keep funding everything leading up to our neighborhood, but don't cross and try to get to the beach. So, I mean, we're dealing with that, and uh, um, uh, how, how is it going? I mean, uh, we, we can argue basically when you get, and if there's a big storm, <clears throat> and especially, I guess, if you wanna use the argument of climate change and all that, um, it would be the state, county, and everybody, taxpayer money, trying to protect that uh, beachfront property from actually eroding. So, I mean, uh, how much time do we actually spend on uh, fighting neighborhoods about beach access? Um, it's actually a very limited amount of staff time right now. As we said, in regards to the coastal encroachment program, I, th I believe you're referencing that um, that is a passive program, and we've asked people to come forward voluntarily and also we are working with the Coastal Commission on a regular basis for some of the bigger uh, locations that have been um, uh, large violators over the years. 
Um, and we are also going to be doing a pilot project in the coming months um, that will take more staff time, but uh, relatively very small amount of time and a, a great return as far as revenue that comes in as a result of that. So that was how we anticipated the program starting. This is sort of that first phase. And as we move forward in the next 18 months, um, probably see phase two implemented um, and hopefully um, five years out, we'll have a, a very robust and uh, functioning, well-functioning program. Right, uh, but uh, th that's true. I understand the time factor, but is it taking money away from the Parks Department? No, actually, um, we've seen revenue uh, brought in as a result of the program, and we now have to make sure we work with the Coastal Commission to accomplish the tasks that we've agreed to with them. That could potentially cost some money, and also, at the same time, um, we will be vigilant about the revenue we use in regards to that so it doesn't um, take away from our department. Right, and I, I guess something else I've mentioned before too, if we, if we have park space and we have uh, uh, beach access and beaches that we're all inviting people to come to and then uh, when uh, a neighborhood or a philosophy of building walls and building fences, I mean, I've seen that happen right. with uh, schools and different areas. Uh, the they, uh, people uh, that run those uh, put up big fences, have it locked up. You, you can drive by the schools, try to have your kids go down and play at a, a public school on a Saturday where they walk down there and they're locked out. Yep. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to see that happen in the county where we put money into the parks and then we build up walls. Yep. Uh, and we're, we're in a county that doesn't like walls yep. uh, <laughs> in certain areas, right? But at the same time, these same people will say, well, yeah, we don't want a wall over there. Uh, sounds familiar, right, the word? But then, uh, but we're okay with having a wall locking off uh, our neighborhood or our park area and everything like that so they can yeah. have their own personal use. And our, and our Parks Commission recently uh, did a, they passed a resolution saying that they supported um, no more obstacles in parks and as, as few fences and walls as possible. And so that was something our Parks yeah. Commission did. And, and I, obviously, I, I'm very supportive of, of less walls and fences. Yeah, I want to make sure our parks are accessible. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, doesn't become exclusive. Uh, the other would be, uh, hey, thanks a lot. Uh, so thank the board and everybody and you for uh, the pump track yeah. that we got in. And uh, it's being used. I've uh, driven oh, yeah. out there and I'm, I'm surprised at how popular it is. Uh, the uh, one little criticism, and that's something we could work out later, we did uh, about 20% or 25% uh, uh, of the cost went to another department, uh, the planning department here in uh, Santa Cruz County. Uh, so I, I guess we're the ones who decide if we're going to be able to, when we're doing something as a joint project, that we don't get the cost where we had to take parks money and give it to uh, planning in order to do. And if it was just a small amount, I wouldn't say anything, but it was about 25% of the cost. Yeah. So maybe we can work something out where we can yeah. streamline something. They, I, I mean, know they uh, have to do their work too. But yeah, and, and the way that they currently that we're structured though is, is each department tries to sustain themselves with the revenue they can bring in. So it, it's, it's, we pay our fair portion, but it is up to this board to decide what they want to do. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul, <laughs> right? So anyway, thank you. And, and this is really, uh, like I said, exciting to that we actually have a department because of funding and everything and the voters actually voted uh, and approved uh, Measure G. I yeah. want to thank the voters on that one. That was a, you know, very good. Uh, Huge. Yeah. So thank, thank you. you. Uh, Supervisor McCarthy. Yeah, there's a couple points I missed. I just wanted to thank the department for working with the Boulder Creek Recreation District a few years back. Um, we got some unfunded mandate money that each district was able to commit to uh, a projects or projects and uh, I, 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 the county decided to uh, dedicate a large portion to the Bear Creek Estates uh, rec program. Uh, it's under the Boulder Creek Recreation Department, but um, 
I want to say thank you for working out that arrangement and Hallie Green that heads up that, she is a tiger. I'll yeah, tell you, she she's is, great. she's excitable you know, uh, see how much she gets done. And uh, I, I just want to thank the Boulder Creek Recreation District and the County Parks Department for working that arrangement out. Uh, people in Northern San Lorenzo Valley are very, very appreciative of that. Um, one, one other point on page 261, the parks completed a, department uh, completed a park dedication fee study. Um, it did, it was, what were the results of that? It was in the last spring, I think it was March of 2019. Uh, what, what did... Uh, um, so that's where we're still, uh, that's the park impact fees that we're currently working towards. Um, and we would be probably uh, working with the CAO's office and the Board of Supervisors in the next couple of months to uh, okay. determine what the best outcome for that is. Great. Now it's, a member, now it's a chance for members of the public to come speak to us. I know we have several. Uh, so if you are interested, please uh, come forward and um, line up. Good morning. My name's Terry Primavera, and I'm a physical therapist at Dominican Hospital, and I help get to coordinate our PEP program, if any of you are familiar with it. I'll leave a few catalogs here in case you'd like to check it out. We have been partnering with Simpkins for the last 20 plus years, and we rent pool space three times a week through three quarters of the year, and then once a week during the busy months in the summer. And we can't be more grateful. We see, last year we saw over 660 participants in the pool, um, and part of those people were patients in our outpatient physical therapy department, and they're seen for a whole host of uh, conditions that really benefit from being in the water. I'm sure you all know the benefits of water, but I'll review a couple. So if you um, are in water up to your chest level, you weigh only 30% of what you weigh on land. So that allows you to do a lot more. Oh, I didn't realize I was being timed. <laughs> I'll make this a little faster. So, okay, fantastic. Um, can also help increase your lung capacity and improve your mobility and um, able to help you manage your weight. So we have several classes each week, some of which um, are special for people with different disabilities. We have classes for people with Parkinson's disease, stroke, cerebral palsy, muscular sclerosis. We have lots of classes for people with lymphedema, which if you don't know is a condition caused primarily after cancer treatment. So with radiation and surgery, your lymph system is, is um, impaired and you can't manage swelling. So you take on fluid and it becomes a risk for infection and can cause death. So people get to manage it by doing daily massage and pumping um, machines, oh dear, uh, <laughs> or the use of water. So it's a much easier, more fun way to do it. So we also see people who are pregnant and then after pregnancy, and then a whole host of typical things that happen as we age, so for people with arthritis. So I had a whole list of people that I wanted to go through, but I won't do that. I'll take a couple um, and tell you with Simpkins partnership, we can really improve people's sense of community and inclusion and independence, fun, and health. So just two quick examples. One, um, we have a woman who moved here to the area, didn't know anyone, was a musician by trade. She came to live with her family. She has... I'm sorry. Uh -oh. We can't... Uh, if, if we could... Uh, Summarize, and you can send us an email with all this information. If okay. You want. In general, we love Simpkins. We don't know what we would do without you. <laughs> We're Perfect. super excited to partner with you. Really, really excited. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you from the entire community that we get to serve. We wouldn't be able to do it without you. So thank you. We're very grateful. Thank you for coming today. Mm -hmm. Good morning, board members. I, my name again is Lori Chamberlain. I'm the superintendent at the Live Oak School District. And I just want to thank you in advance for adding to your board um, 
approval, the waiver for permit fees for the for the soccer field, the Live Oak School District soccer field at Shoreline Middle School. Um, this has been a long time coming, as I started to say. It's been a three-year plan in the project, maybe even more in Bill's mind. But it, it's been a dream, and it's really kind of the field of dreams. Um, just as Bill's uh, pet project was the swim center, working with the county, now he's working with our school district to make sure that students have a safe place to play soccer, the track team has a safe place to run, and because it will also have a running path, but the entire community has access to it. So families will be there enjoying soccer. Uh, adults in the community will have the opportunity to play soccer. We're planning to add lights to the soccer field, LED lights set face down so it doesn't radiate out. Um, and there will be bleachers and picnic tables. So we're very excited about this opportunity. We really appreciate the support we've gotten also from John Leopold, helping us through that permit process and the, the way that everything works uh, within bureaucracies and systems we know is going to be complicated. And also thank you to Jeff Gaffney, who was also there at the groundbreaking ceremony on May the 20th. But special thank you, obviously, also to Bill Simpkins. Um, in total, he has raised over $2.5 million. One million of those dollars came directly from Bill and Bridget Simpkins. And uh, he's just been tireless in his efforts to, to um, get private donors, uh, foundations, um, different groups to donate money. Kaiser's also put down a fair amount of money in this project, as they've also as assisted the Live Oak community in other ways, in other schools. So again, I want to thank you all for your support. This, again, doesn't just benefit our students, but benefits the entire community. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for partnering with us. And thank you for your partnership uh, on the Boys and Girls Club and and the Cradle to Career program. And it, you know, Live Oak is a great school district that collaborates with others to the benefit of their families. And uh, I really appreciate that. Hi, my name is Bill Simpkins, and I'm with the, the soccer group. And first, John, thanks for helping <laughs> us get that permit. That's a uh, few sleepless nights there. Yeah. Um, I really appreciate your guys' help on this with the soccer field. We've raised two and a half million dollars so far, and we're just about there. And so I, we're, we hopefully will be done at the end of October, but uh, I think financially we're there. Um, Zach, you know, I agree with you 100%. I think projects like this where you get public and private is the way to go. I think it's a lot easier than you think if you have the right project. When we did the fundraising, I'm telling you, I would get halfway through a discussion with a fundraiser and they go, I get it. How can I help? And I think projects like this, could we could be a model of what could be done with the county and the county doing this. Those kids and those families on a Sunday afternoon are going to be playing on that soccer field. They're not going to know who owns the soccer field, and they don't care. They just know that they're playing on a soccer field. And I think it's more, more possible than you think. Again, thank you for helping. And one last thing, Jeff does a heck of a job for the county. I'm telling you, he is the best. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. Where, where is the soccer field? Excuse me? Where is it located? I, I didn't catch that. The, the soccer field is at, on 17th Avenue, and it'll be right next to the swim center. Good. On 17th right, Avenue, right, so it's going to be the swim center, the Boys and Girls Club. Um, people will be playing there in the evenings. Their kids could be at the Boys and Girls. It's all. It all works. Great. It's the perfect thank place you. for it. And Bill, I just want to thank you for your philanthropy. You've really um, made life better for families in Live Oak. I know your commitment uh, to, uh, to the community is very strong. You do lots of things with the school district. Uh, obviously, the swim center would not have been possible without you. And this project, you've your personal leadership to help make it happen is is, is really spectacular. And it's going to benefit families for years and years to come. And the innovative way in which you've used that the fees for the project are going to go into a fund to allow us to, uh, to to allow the school district to replace the materials uh, over time without having to go out and, and do a big fundraising campaign is a great example of uh, innovation to help long-term sustainability of the field. This is going to be a great deal. You're getting a soccer field for five cents on the dollar. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Things written down. Hello, everyone, and thank you. And I think there is a wonderful theme of partnership that I'm hearing today. Um, my name is Mariah Roberts, and I am here supporting the department. I'm here supporting our partnership with um, Jeff Gaffney and all of the staff. 
You all know me probably mostly as one of the moms behind Leo's Haven at Chanticleer Park. Um, today, Oliver is at a therapy session, so he and Trisha can't be here. But because of the partnership with all of you and with the department, the, the park is under construction. You saw a picture of our kids out there. Um, Supervisor Leopold was there as well, as well as all of the staff with their hard hats on, sitting on the machines, having a good old time. You know, our kids are seeing that this can happen. Um, and I really wanted to come out today um, to, to sort of be proof um, of this, this idea that partnership can work. Um, we did. We are. Uh, we raised $2 million um, of mostly small donations. Um, and now we have a public legacy project that will be here for generations. Um, more importantly, it proved to anyone who doubted that our community can come together to support public space. Um, Trisha and I both are very proud to have joined now the Friends of Santa Cruz County Parks, and we look forward to figuring out how to make these partnerships happen. How do we do it? We are here, and we are ready to go. Um, and we're continuing this partnership because the Parks Department has been an open, creative, trustworthy, and effective partner. We're continuing because in the strategic planning process that we were lucky enough to participate in, we heard from all of our neighbors how much they care about these places. Um, and we know that the Parks Department needs a solid financial foundation so that we can continue to bring in investment and, and create partnerships to improve these places. So we're grateful for your partnership and all of uh, the time that you give to support this department. Um, and we're looking forward to a lot of good work in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your hard work. Yeah, thank you for your leadership, not well only done. at Leo's Haven, <laughs> on the Parks Commission, and now the, the Friends of the Parks. So continue that great work. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Terry Corwin. I am the board chair of Friends of Santa Cruz County Parks, um, formerly CEO and president of the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County. And it was in that role that I learned that Santa Cruz County is a bit of an outlier in terms of low amounts of dedicated funding for parks and open space. And it's actually, I want to support our vice chair, um, Mariah, and her comments. But I'd like to focus on Director Gaffney's quest to convert general fund money to dedicated fund money. And I think it creates an opportunity for creative problem solving. I had the privilege of serving on the County Park Strategic Planning Work Group, and a goal of that community-based project is to create dedicated and sufficient funding for the Parks Department so that it's not eviscerated the next time we have a recession, which will happen uh, as it was in 2008. So Mariah and I, with the support of the rest of the Growing Friends of County Parks organization, are looking forward to meeting with each of you to explore ideas on how to make this so. The voters of Santa Cruz County have consistently supported their county parks and open spaces via Measure F, Measure D with the wildlife tunnel and the rail trail, and overwhelmingly in Measure G. So I am committed to leading Friends to play a key role in a new initiative. So let's figure out a way to let the voters of this community have their say in supporting their beloved parks and open spaces. Thank you so much, Jeff, and for all of you for the work that you do. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak. My name is Dave Ramos, and uh, one of the things that I do here in the community is I'm a treatment technician at Janus of Santa Cruz, and I wanted to offer my thanks and support for the Parks Department as well as for Simpkins Swim Center specifically. Uh, every Tuesday and Thursday, we bring our, our clients, our addicts and alcoholics, to Simpkins Swim Center to swim, and this is an activity that is widely beneficial more for their mental health as well as their physical health. This is something that's extremely awesome, and through the generosity of Mr. Simpkins, uh, one of the other things I do in the community is I'm a radio talk show host for the Veterans Take Charge radio show, and I recently found out that Simpkins Swim Center offers free swimming for veterans. Uh, currently, right now, Miss Kim Rutherford is getting ready to take a handful of people to swim from mainline, um, uh, mainland to Alcatraz, and the opportunity is just spectacular and fantastic. So I wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, good morning all. Um, thank you very much. I'm Trudy Ransom. I'm from the SUP Shack. Uh, I have the Santa Cruz uh, SUP Shack. And also I want to thank the County Parks and everyone for giving me this opportunity uh, for creating a second uh, SUP Shack at Rio de Mar. We're excited of all the work that you're doing there. I go down there weekly to sort of see how it's progressing and you know, should take an opportunity and have a look at how it's uh, progressing. Um, we're going to be doing some fabulous things, working with the Aptos Chamber. Um, we're going to be, we've got the grant for the wheelchair uh, access. So I didn't really prepare for this today. I was just going <laughs> to like come down and just say thank you. Uh, yeah, it's going to be cool. Thank you for doing all this. Um, we're going to be having another ribbon cutting when it's done. And we'd like to invite you all to come down. And we're excited to get the public out there to have some parks. You know, what you were talking about earlier, I thought, oh yeah, we can do some youth programs there because we have some very cool youth programs going on at the SUP Shack in Santa Cruz. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Barbara Jordan with the Santa Cruz Pickleball Club. Um, uh, you probably know us. And um, we wanted to thank you all for supporting us, both the Parks Department and Jeff and the supervisors in letting us run programs at Bromer Street Park in Willowbrook. And in particular, Supervisor Leopold for helping us work our way through the process to get our dream of four permanent pickleball courts at Bromer Street Park. And they are being used, I guarantee you, there are people out there right now using them, having put towels down to dry off the courts. Um, what, what we do kind of an informal tracking of how we've progressed over the years, and I thought you might be interested in those numbers. Um, at Bromer Street Park in 2018, granted this is not scientific, so I, <laughs> but at Bromer Street Park, uh, we, ran 81 sessions of three hours each, averaging 40 people per session. That's eight people waiting on average every time we do our sessions. Um, I came up with this participant hour number, I don't know if it's a real thing, but um, that translates to 9,700 participant hours at that one site in 2018. At Willowbrook, which is a smaller site, we use only once a week, we had an average of 31 players per session, which was 2,400 hours of participant hours. So I just wanted you to know that they are being used and that your support of our little sport, um, I think is uh, a worthwhile investment. And thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Jordan. Thank you for you, the, all the support that the Pickleball Club offers to make those courts heavily used, yeah. which is uh, the goal. And thank you for your support of the uh, Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors and our County Council's office in our annual competition. <laughs> ah, that's right. <laughs> Good morning. And I am here as a member of the Valley Women's Club Board and the director of the San Lorenzo Valley Native Habitat Restoration Program. And I would like to offer my support for the budget for the Santa Cruz County Parks Department. I've collaborated closely with the county parks since 2015, planning and hosting five AmeriCorps teams. What was accomplished in the Valley could not have happened without the strong partnership that exists between the Valley Women's Club program and the committed administrative staff of county parks. Jeff Gaffney's support, but a special um, acknowledgement of Eric Strum and Margaret Ingram, who were crucial in the planning and organizing of a very successful year this year. And they've also set the standard for what we'll be doing over the next five years. Our vision for habitat restoration in the San Lorenzo Valley became a reality because of our collaboration with county parks. They provided the living accommodation, the staff to run the heavy equipment. They also shared tools and supplied necessary materials. And in addition, they supplied a CPR class for all of the teams to become certified, which was a big deal because AmeriCorps looks for these classes to be provided by the sponsoring um, entities. These aspects of the partnership were crucial, but equally important was the dedication of park staff to maintaining to a very high level the parks in the valley to the highest standard even when they were short staffed. I support Santa Cruz County Parks and the ongoing work that they do with great enthusiasm. 
I would also like to thank Bruce McPherson for his support of the team over all of these years. He sets aside time to come and have dinner with us and, and, <laughs> and to come in and meet with the team. So thank you very much for your support. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jane Neal, Vice President of the Valley Women's Club Board, and I'm here in support of the budget. And uh, one of the reasons is because it allows for the restoration work, which is vital in the parks, because that way you can have bird walks and trail walks. And what you do up River matters down river. I'm also the lead of the estuary restoration project, which is under the Valley Women's Club, and the co-linking is important. Also, I love that the budget is uh, having preteen teen camps because that is very underserved, as my grandsons tell me. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sheila Delaney, president of the Valley Women's Club. We have uh, a history of relationship with the county and the county parks. We also have fabulous state parks in our district. But um, we have been working on the Felton Discovery Park. We have collaborated with Boulder Creek Rex and, Rec and Parks. We umbrellaed the Quail, Quail Hollow Friends of the Park when they started. And I'm looking forward to partnering and doing more work possibly in Ben Lomond, which is the one place left that we haven't done some stuff. Um, so I'm very excited about this budget and I don't have to pay fine. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, members of the board. My name is Augie Dent and I'm here representing the Opal Cliff Recreational District. And I just wanted to come in and like everyone else, express my thanks to uh, Director Gaffney and his staff for the recent partnership we've put together to kind of coordinate the operations of the district. And I, I think it's really been a, a, great, a great cooperation, a great partnership. So we're thankful, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, Board of Supervisors. Uh, I'm Brian Largay, Conservation Director with the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County. And it's a pleasure to address you today in support of the County Parks Department. Um, the Land Trust is guided by a conservation blueprint, uh, which Terry Corwin pioneered, a 25-year vision for the county that emphasizes core themes, and parks is particularly relevant to a couple of them. One of them is biodiversity. As you know, we uh, globally are facing a, an extinction crisis. County Parks manages land where we have uh, bald eagle breeding, coho salmon breeding, uh, rare plants up at uh, Quail Hollow uh, Park, and uh, we are greatly appreciative of the work County Parks does to steward those essential resources. Uh, we also have a healthy communities initiative around uh, getting outdoors and staying healthy. And I think sometimes parks are viewed as frosting on the cake. It's kind of an extra. Um, but I think it's important to realize that we have a crisis in healthy communities too, uh, whether it's physical activity and associated premature death associated with diabetes or uh, a lack of uh, community and uh, time in nature, which is associated with increased rates of depression and suicide, um, or if it's the crisis of equity and opportunity for all people uh, to enjoy the, uh, the community and, and natural things that um, bring health and well-being to us. And uh, Parks is at the front line in addressing those issues and a fantastic investment in preventative medicine that gives people the opportunity to stay healthy, get healthy, and choose their own path for how they're going to achieve that. And uh, I just want to express strong support for Jeff's uh, leadership in uh, making that a reality here. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you. you for your work. Well, here I am at the right place in the right time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, name, <clears throat> my name is James Williams. I uh, want to have two things to say. I have pages of notes which I'm, I'm going to forget about because most of what I had to say has been, has been um, wonderfully expressed already. 
I have two things. One, I represent Friends of Quail Hollow, and we've been in operation for a number of years when the parks didn't exist, the parks department didn't exist, and the county was in some hard budgetary times. We think we helped keep Quail Hollow Park alive and well during those times. There's a couple things that we've noticed, and I think it's important. You folks are irresponsible for the macro overview, the budget, and so forth and so on. I'm one of the micro people. I wander around Quail Hollow and I talk to people who enjoy the park. People like us notice the difference. We really do. Jeff and his crew, his staff, and the Board of Supervisors are really on the right arc. And you need to keep it up. And the park's budget is critical to that, uh, uh, to, uh, to that effort. The second thing um, I want to say is I'm a grandfather. And I'm also a follower of E.O. Wilson, if you, if you know his, his work in biology and his half-earth theory, theory. It's not just important, it's not just nice, it's critical for young kids to experience the out of doors. Quail Hollow is just one example. There's many others in the county and the state parks. It's absolutely necessary to have good, clean, accessible parks. And I think Santa Cruz County is an excellent example of that very, uh, of putting into practice that very theory. So thank you very much for what you've done so far and keep it up. And in your deliberations, if you come across any excess money here and there, the parks is the best place to put it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Supervisors. My name is Kate Minot. I'm the Parks Commissioner for the Second District. And I wanted to thank each of you for your Com Parks Commissioners. This is, we're a great group of representatives and it's a great way for each one of us to know what's going on in other parts of the county. Um, thank you, Supervisor Friend, for bringing up Seacliff Village Park. This is something that has been uh, on the forefront of, uh, and not to be forgotten, so really appreciate that. I think that there's some great partnerships that can make sure we get our, fa even get into phase two, so. Thanks very much, everybody, and yay parks. Yay. Are there any other public speakers who'd like to s talk to us about this item? Oops, Scott. Okay. Hi, my name is Karen Long, and I'm actually the president of the Santa Cruz Pickleball Club, and I wasn't gonna say anything because Barb did such a great job. But when I heard these last three speakers, I thought, you know what? One thing that the pickleball has not addressed really or done any outreach for is children. And this sport is phenomenal for children. And if we can get them into playing pickleball at an early age and getting them out and moving and healthy and just appreciating the outdoors, that would be phenomenal. Whether we put one court in one little neighborhood here or there, you know, since tennis has been unfortunately declining for whatever reason, we don't know. But to be able to put a court somewhere in a neighborhood and then to have these kids talk would be phenomenal. So that just kind of came through my mind. And I just wanted to say, I hope I see everybody out there playing at this supervisor's get together because it's gonna be a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will, and uh, you gotta let us know if county council's been out there secretly practicing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so that concludes public comment. I'll bring it back to the board for deliberation and action. Um, I wanted to Mr. Provide. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, if I could uh, provide one clarification before you act on the budget. Uh, regarding the supplemental item uh, for the Live Oak soccer uh, complex fees, I uh, just wanted to clarify that we're not waiving the fees. We're in fact making a general fund contribution to pay for the fees. And that is because legally, um, most fees that the, char the county charges uh, cannot be waived. Uh, impact fees, other drainage, storm drain fees, you can't waive them uh, legally. Uh, there are some fees that we can waive, uh, but these are not those. <laughs> and so what has to happen is when we have a county project or other, we actually have to make a general fund contribution to, to uh, pay our fair share of those fees because we're considered just as every other um, user as, one, as a member of the, uh, contributing member of the public in, in those kind of impact fees. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'd like to uh, move the recommended budget uh, and, and note also that I think we've had more people speak on the benefits of our parks than any other subject matter that we've had to date. Yeah. Uh, so it's significant, no it's a small part of our budget, but it's a big part of a healthy community. And thank you very much for coming. Great, we've got a motion by uh, McPherson, a second by Caput. Any other discussions? Uh, just one last thing I wanna say. Uh, uh, Cheryl Bailey is here. She's uh, is, she's good. Her position is is being eliminated in this uh, budget, but she has been a critical person in in so many projects um, in the Mid County and elsewhere. Uh, the Heart of Soquel project is happening in part because she's she's been able to shepherd that through, write the grants, organize the, the community meetings, uh, really work hard at that. We have lots of parks that uh, have Cheryl's fingerprints on it, lots of redevelopment projects uh, before that. Um, I've really enjoyed uh, working with her. Uh, she's been an important part of the county family and, and, um, and I just want to recognize her for that work because it's been outstanding. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, so we have a motion and we have a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. Thank you to Jeff and the whole team uh, for all the really great work you're doing. Thank you very much. <coughs> Our uh, next item is item number 35, which is to consider the 2019 to 21 proposed budgets for the planning department, including housing funds, as outlined in, a, in the reference budget documents, and schedule the continuing agreements list items for final approval on last day budget hearings, June 25th, 2019, as outlined in a memorandum of the planning director. And we have uh, Ms. Provovich here to, uh, to speak to us today. Good morning, uh, Chair and Board and, and all. Um, the Planning Department and the Housing Funds is pleased to be here. This slide shows you an overview of the content of the presentation. We'd be happy to take questions as we go or we can uh, do that at the end, at, uh, whichever you prefer. Uh, we'll start off with some of the accomplishments and what we're still working on accomplishing, some key things in the Planning Department. Every section has been involved in some very significant achievements this year. And these are just some of the highlights. <coughs> With regard to e-plan, um, <coughs> those permit applications continue to increase, kinks continue to be worked out, and we've set a September 1st date to implement a practice that nearly all building permit applications will be need, required to be submitted through e-plan. So training sessions for members of the public are being arranged for July and August, and there is already uh, YouTube videos available online for how uh, our customers can uh, use ePlan. I'm proud to say that the team has made uh, big improvements to our online permitting system. So just three days ago, uh, members of the public will now be able to pull common types of building permits fully from home or the office. So they can apply online for the permit, they can pay for it online, and they can print out their own permit right at home or at the office. The first time they'll see a county employee is at that first building inspection. So no need to come to the county building. And so we're very excited about that and, and we know our customers will really appreciate that. Uh, within the building section also, uh, some very significant projects have uh, been going on this past year and I wanna particularly recognize a senior building inspector, Sean Livingston, who's been providing uh, building inspection services to two projects in Aptos, the Aptos Village mixed use project and the Rancho del Mar revitalization of that shopping center. Uh, with respect to code compliance, um, that's uh, really having a, a great year as well. We've fully implemented the administrative citation program and that's effective. And I also wanted to uh, spe especially note a major accomplishment of the cleanup of the Kaler property up in the San Lorenzo Valley where many inoperative vehicles had been stored with environmental and community impacts and that has now been fully abated. Uh, using county abatement funds, and that was one of the priority abatements uh, that your board directed a while back. Uh, in development review, um, in permits uh, activity is up. Uh, we successfully implemented the new hosted rental program last summer with all 250 available permits being issued by March. Also, the new cannabis permitting program uh, began uh, last summer 
it's challenging, complicated uh, program, but we are meeting its challenges. More applications are being submitted, more are being deemed complete, uh, and we'll some, we've had one approved and several um, scheduled for approval in the very near future, including the Kitayama uh, project uh, scheduled for approval on July 5th. So um, also in the development, uh, discretionary development side of the planning department, there are several very significant development per permit applications underway. Um, and also uh, policies and housing section is continuing to complete the affordable housing code amendments and those should be complete by the end of the year. Uh, as you, you know, we've been working on the safety and noise general plan elements and associated uh, code changes for quite some time. The coastal bluffs and beaches in particular are very, very complex. So you'll be hearing first the noise and airports components at the end of August and then the remaining portion of the safety element uh, at the end of September. We've completed the, the Seascape Beach Estates Combining Zoning District and that will be submitted to the Coastal Commission in July along with the cannabis code changes that you're taking action on. We've completed the Pleasure Point Commercial Area Vision and Peritola Drive Streetscape Project and um, a, a significant effort is the Primo Pi Permit Improvement Effort and that's well underway. We've got three teams that um, are leading uh, improvements to <coughs> technology to our building permit process and the zoning and discretionary permit process. Members, that, you know, that'll include all, all agencies involved with the permit process, all staff welcome to uh, participate and encouraged to, but being led in particular by some of the managers and staff that have been through the lean uh, green belt and uh, continuous process improvement training, as well as other leadership program. So on the, on the sustainability and special projects side, we're also very happy to have filled the last vacancy in our section. We had struggled with vacant positions for quite some time and, and lack of resources as well. So that things are really coming together nicely. Uh, we've hired traffic and EIR consultants as well. And um, your board will have a study session on that effort at your meeting of September 24th. Getting to the numbers now then, this is an overview of the planning department numbers. It does not include the housing funds. Uh, for the coming two year budget, we're not anticipating a whole lot of change. We are expecting some modest increase in development permit revenue year over year based on last year's actuals and projected permit levels over the next two years. Our expenses about are about 2.2 million supported by about 3.1 million from the general fund and 9.1 in revenue from permit activity grants and other charges. So that translates to a 75% cost recovery rate. And this is a, a slide we've seen in, in past years that sort of tracks over time. The, the uh, gray bars show actual uh, general fund support. The green bars show what was in the adopted budgets. So you'll see Last year we had a pretty aggressive um, forecast for permit activity, which didn't come true. Uh, some of the, some significant d development projects either didn't submit or didn't make as much progress toward build building building permits. And of course we had quite a bit less cannabis permit activity than we had anticipated. Uh, so all in all, revenues average from the general fund average about $3 million per year over the past seven years. and. Uh, we expect that next year we'll have about a 2% increase in revenue over this year's actuals and a bit greater increase the, the second year of this two year budget. So th those again are the, the cost recovery numbers in terms of how self-supporting our department is through revenues, grants and, and, and else other revenues that come in. So um, we're at 75%, which is a uh, I think a remarkable number really. Um, and in part, that is because of staffing. We've been able to sort of hold staffing fairly constant, even though some of the, the numbers of activities are going up. So use of technology is helping us become more efficient and um, we're able to keep uh, those staff numbers uh, somewhat stable. So this is an overview slide of the changes over the past few years. 
Uh, we've, we've held pretty stable at 67, 68 filled positions. Um, we're nearly, um, nearly completely full of, of all our vacancies. We've still got a couple, but we're, we're filling those in the coming year in order to meet our uh, expectations about general fund contribution and also just the needs of the organization. We are um, proposing to delete one half-time position and also we are unfunding the assistant director and we anticipate keeping that second assistant director position unfunded for the next couple of years. Uh, we're, uh, and it, this is an overview of the staffing over time you know, significantly reduced in uh, the years uh, starting about 10 years ago when, with the recession and the loss of the redevelopment agency. And over the past years, we've been slowly building back up staffing levels. Um, um, we're very pleased that our department, you know, plays a strong role in helping to achieve the uh, county's strategic plans and some of its key um, strategies and objectives relate very strongly to work that we have going on in our department. Over the next two years, a major focus will be on the general plan local coastal program, sustainability update, and code modernization. And, and that relates to the community development objective. And so by the, per the operational plan, we're stating that we'll be completing the certification of that EIR by June of 2021 and that will be a, a long-awaited and significant achievement that we look forward to. Another uh, strategic plan goal relates to reliable transportation, and so a part of that sustainability general plan update is the circulation element update. So that will reflect um, a lot of the Regional Transportation Commission's plans and priorities, but we all are also doing a countywide study of local traffic conditions in the unincorporated area. Uh, the analysis will reflect a shift to vehicle miles traveled consistent with the recent update of the CEQA guidelines. And we're really going, you know, we realize how frustrating traffic congestion is um, in, in the unincorporated area. And so our traffic consultant and, and the team will be really challenging ourselves to see what, what can be done to in address traffic con congestion and, you know, maybe some new ideas that, that uh, can help out and then be related to the traffic impact fee program in terms of yet more funding for implementation. Talking a little bit more about the um, strategic plan and operational plan as it relates to operational ex excellence, that is the, um, the Primo Pi is one of the demonstration projects. It's a, it's a complex demonstration project for the lean uh, Primo effort. And we, you may know that we had a great team of staff from all of the permitting agencies spend a week in December of 2018 with a consultant. Many of uh, staff also participated in the Lean Greenbelt training. And that process has been invaluable with many near-term successes. We've got a program of continuing work efforts involving all staff. And um, it will be a continuous process improvement. You know, we, we'll be working hard, hard on it and probably never fully get done, but there's a lot of exciting things that have been identified that can really help out. So one, during one of the efforts during that first week in December was the Permit Center uh, group of people participating in that developed a mission and vision and values, consistent again with the county strategic plan, and that's presented here. Um, in talking a bit about you know why we were so eager to be a demonstration project in the lean, you know, primo effort, uh, we, we interact a lot with um, members of the public. You know, we process a lot of permits, we do a lot of site inspections, lots of code compliance, we, people, public information at the counter, um, environmental planning, t you know, touches not only building permits, but also discretionary permits, do CEQA review. We've got more and more activity happening over email with e-plans, uh, with building and zoning info lines, and so thousands and thousands and thousands of interactions and a lot of opportunity to clarify, streamline, and better serve our customers through applying the tools of continuous process improvement. 
during that first week. Um, you know, this was one of the tools is uh, used was, I, I, I frankly forget what you call this diagram, but they, <laughs> they think of a lot of ideas and put them on sticky notes and then arrange them by ease of implementation and how impact, impactful implementation of that idea might be. And, uh, you know, paste them up into the quadrants and use that as a way to prioritize work on some of those um, effort, improvement efforts. In, ad in addition to, um, you know, the, the Primo Pi and the, you know, code changes and process changes and organizational collaboration and, you know, trying to strive together to function as one development services center uh, as operationally, we're excited um, to be working also on a physical manifestation of that and are beginning to look at floor plan changes and physical changes to our, our lobby and public counter area uh, to, to really be able to implement a true one-stop public counter uh, staffed by all permitting departments and agencies. So we are hoping that, that that is complete by June of 2021. At this point then, I'm gonna um, have Julie Conway go through the housing section of the presentation. Good morning, board members. The planning department manages 19 active housing funds that are aggregated for budgetary purposes. The housing fund balances are typically appropriated in order to be available to commit to housing activities because timing of the activities can be uncertain. An example, the current fiscal year budget appropriated about $5 million anticipating support of the 17th and Capitola Road affordable housing project. This will happen next fiscal year rather than f this fiscal year. Whoops. The housing funds uh, hold dollars available for investment um, are the low and moderate income housing asset fund, um, or the RDA reuse fund, the affordable housing impact fee fund, and the remaining dollars of the plant fund from the pre-2011 housing bond, um, which is where the housing services contract lives. This year's investment in the revolving loan fund for the affordable housing preservation program uh, was established through the housing services contract, and that ensures that the county will have the ability to preserve um, affordable home ownership units. The 17th and Capitola Road project is expected to soon be scheduled for public hearing for its discretionary permits, and after that, um, for a funding commitment will be recommended. Your board recently approved acquisition funding uh, for the land property, and that funding is expected to be expended in the next few months. The state has been reorganizing its housing grant programs with additional funding made available with the passage of recent bond measures. Um, the housing section will continue to pursue every opportunity to bring housing money into the county. Uh, we expect to learn in July whether a $3 million CDBG grant application uh, will be awarded funding. That request included funding for construction of a new clinic for the Santa Cruz Community Health Center, rehabilitation of an existing farm worker housing property, and a planning grant for domestic water in Davenport. The planning department is collaborating with the health services agency on the No Place Like Home program in an effort to create housing for people who are chronically homeless and have a serious mental illness. These units can be part of any affordable housing project throughout the county and the cities. The county health department is an applicant for all NPLH projects, and the projects could add between 50 and 75 units in the coming years for this target population. Housing staff will work with partners to submit competitive funding applications through state bond funds and low-income housing tax credits. These projects need local match dollars to be competitive, so using limited county housing dollars strategically to maximize the number of units created is important. And of course, housing requires adequate, appropriately zoned land, um, and the department is uh, actively working on making that possible as well. As stated earlier, the planning department is working on completing regulatory amendments for employee-sponsored housing, including farm worker housing, and the department hopes to assist stakeholders and nonprofits to successfully implement these employer-sponsored housing projects uh, in the near future. 
A key effort for the operational plan is farm worker housing, and your board recently endorsed goals of providing 300 beds within small projects on farms and 200 units of family farm worker housing. The Atkinson Lane Lamb site is being acquired by Midpen Housing, and this would be the first project that will work towards meeting the goal of um, affordable housing for farm worker families. Turn it back to Kathy. All right. <laughs> One of the other uh, county strategic plan goals relates to dynamic economy and achieving a dynamic economy in part relies on having housing for employees, being able to reliably get from point A to point B on the transportation network and maintaining the quality and desirability of both natural resource assets and built environments of neighborhoods in the community. So those factors that support a dynamic economy as described earlier in these presentation are, are all factors that the planning department work plan activity supports um, to, to support achievement of a dynamic economy. We, uh, we're processing um, several key development permit applications, as, as mentioned before. That includes a very large new medical office building, new affordable housing projects, a large shopping center revitalization project, and the 7th and Bromer visitor accommodation and housing project um, as some of the key projects we're, we'll be processing. The, with regard to the sustainable environment, um, again, there's that safety element um, that will hopefully soon be adopted and then it will need to go to the Coastal Commission for certification. But that does um, meet cer certain recent, fairly recent state laws that require the county to address climate change and other hazards. And with respect to uh, the hazards, a related document is making sure that the local hazard mitigation program is kept up to date and that is something that David Carlson is the lead planner on, and that ensuring that we get that on done on time, which is by December of 2020, uh, allows the county to preserve its ongoing eligibility for uh, disaster planning and disaster relief funds. So that is an important document to make sure it gets done on time. Um, lastly then, um, a big thank you to the planning department team. We're very, very fortunate to have such a dedicated and talented team. There have been many accomplishments over the past year and very important work ahead of us. So I extend my thanks to each and every one of them, as well as to the planning commissioners to, and to the CAO's office, especially Melody Serino, and to each of you board members. Thank you very much. That concludes the presentation. Thank you. Um, I'll just begin by saying, um, I just wanna thank you for your leadership. You just referred to uh, people making applications to the county as clients. Uh, that's, a, that's a big change uh, in sort of a symbol of a change in culture and the e-permitting and the streamlining and the primo and, um, and I thought your uh, operational plan goals uh, are, are really good and a step in a, in a good direction at, at really simplifying the process for people and doing um, more permits with, with the same number of staff. So uh, that's not easy and I know there are all kinds of systemic changes and cultural changes that have to be made, but um, but I want to thank you and the entire department for really, you know, grabbing on and and being uh, taking this uh, with gusto. Uh, are there questions, Supervisor McChrystal? Sure. Yeah, I, a couple of statements and then questions. Uh, you have a full plate. There's no question about it. There's a lot of issues that uh, related to housing and general planning that. Uh, You've, you've got to come to grips with by the end of next year for sure, uh, but um, a lot of right up, up, up for, uh, uh, in front of us. Um, and I want to thank you for making uh, a difference uh, in addressing our house, housing shortage. Uh, as I've said, in uh, 40 years I haven't seen the energy or the emphasis placed on we need the need for more housing in Santa Cruz County and to catch up is going to be very difficult. But I think with the accessory dwelling units, uh, code modernization, enhanced um, bonus, bonus, uh, bonus densities and uh, farm worker housing issues, uh, we're going to be able to reach those goals. And uh, there's a lot of issues that are, they're not moving targets anymore, but uh, there are opportunities for us to reach some of our housing goals. Um, we, you, I ha appreciate having an additional planner through the supplemental budget. Uh, 
and the, the work requirements you face. I think that's well deserved and it's about time. Uh, and I'm glad to see that we're finally moving ahead on with the environmental review and the long sought after sustainable Santa Cruz County plan. Uh, you do hope to, uh, I, I hope that, uh, and I, uh, th from your presentation I see that part of that is to uh, hopefully reduce the stress on our transportation network too. Uh, and we've heard other people say about um, having people be home at their, uh, being able to do their jobs at home so they don't have to make that, which should be a 20 minute drive from Watsonville to be uh, 40 minutes to an hour uh, each way. So uh, I, th I think it all comes together if we can get the planning structure right and some of the policies that we're trying to, some of our departments are trying to uh, face here. Um, our office receives m many concerns about the need for more code enforcement, and you did address this. I mean, we had, I think, 75 uh, unresolved code enforcement cases in the San Ramsa Valley, which seems to be where a lot of those uh, cases reside. Um, and we were about, we were able to um, address about 10% of them. With what you have now, do you think we'll be able to make a bit, and w a key one up in the upper San Lorenzo Valley, um, do you think that you'll be able to resolve more of those issues then this year? Yes, um, I guess I'll, I'll use the opportunity to point out that if, if you remember a year or two ago, we sort of collapsed all the different flavors of um, <coughs> abatement funds um, into one fund so that we would have more flexibility to, uh, for use and not, not be constrained to this type of abatement versus another. And so we brought to you uh, some recommendations for key priority abatement projects that county funds would be used to abate, and you, you endorsed those, and we're carrying those out, and we're nearly complete. But that means that that pot of money um, is nearly nearly exhausted. So we have not requested in this proposed budget um, new funding into abatement funds, but you know I think that would be something to keep an eye on with respect to how effective um, we are going to be able to be especially with regard to some of those significant large abatements where the property owners are simply not complying and not not properly abating. Um, other than that, I think we, we have a strong team in the code compliance section. If I were to be asked, you know, if you had one more position that you're able to fund and fill, what would it be? It would probably be the code in a code compliance officer in the code section. Yeah. We have one position in our budget that is remaining unfunded. Yeah, well, they've done an excellent job in that uh, with what you have. and. Um, it's, it's uh, a, a continuous uh, subject of conversation up in the San Lorenzo Valley and I think throughout the county. Um, so I, if you could make a modest investment in one place, that would probably be it. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, what timeline do you have now for <coughs> creating the one-stop shop Did you say, um, with Public Works? I, uh, with that, I want to say this is another example of um, a collaborative effort that I'm really impressed with, and I think the people of, uh, the, well, the, the employees of the county and the people of Santa Cruz County will appreciate for many years to come when we get this done. Uh, and I just wanted to uh, get a, a, an idea of the timeline on it and make sure that environmental health is really involved in that, um, that process. Yes, um, definitely. We're working with Public Works and Environmental Health most prominently and also the other permitting agencies, sanitation, fire, et, et cetera. It'll pick up more strength and speed um, as we get more into it. But the hope is, you know, the op on the optimistic side, we'd be have a one-stop shop at the end of 2020. Realistically, it'll probably go into 2021 before we're actually opening the door to a, a new physical space. Do you, do you think that the, the e-permitting and so forth will help with that whole situation um, in some sense, I guess? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one, one thing to point out, I suppose, is uh, that we're, we're, we're keeping an eye on is that with e-plan, the metering that happens in terms of, you know, people getting in line, signing up, um, taking slots at the counter, you know, there's only so many people we can serve. Um, right. With ePlan, it's, it's open 24-7, and so we'll be getting lots of, of applications and we'll be really needing to, to service that ePlan system more, and it'll be interesting to see how that affects volumes at the public counter. Um, I, I think we're going to be in a position to process more permits, um, and you know if there, there's efficiencies. Certainly, with ePlan, it's going to make our our issuing those no regular common types of building permits 
is gonna reduce our workload um, as the customer is able to just apply and print them out themselves. Um, but but we're, it'll be interesting to monitor to see yeah. what happens, but it'll be interesting we to see. expect to be, be issuing more permits with more yeah, efficiently. It'd be, be interesting to get some kind of a track record by say by the end of the year or something, the first year, f yeah. how that's going. Or well, this is the year we're focusing on performance metrics, performance, right? Yeah, so right. we're, uh, we're think, we have so, our thinking caps yeah. on in terms of uh, measuring right now uh, <laughs> how things are and being able to compare uh, as we okay. make these improvements with what's what's happening. And with the um, approval of the state budget, and there's some follow-up legislation, but there, there, there's a, a real focus on housing, um, and that's come as you've developed, started developing this budget uh, six months plus ago. Uh, does what the state has done in regard to housing in general, does that create more opportunities to these 19 active housing plans, or is there anything that's coming along that you expected or didn't expect? Uh, yeah, there's the there's quite a bit more funding coming um, out of the state, and you know, starting with the SP2 grant, you recently at your last meeting authorized us to submit an application for three hundred and ten thousand um, dollars, and that will help our general plan update and. Um, help us get ready for the housing element update, you know, doing the EIR, um, th that's gonna help a lot. And then most recently there's, I think you received a report at the AMBAG board just last yeah. week of an, uh, another pot of money that's becoming available to collections of councils of government. And so we're in the central coast kind of mega cog. And as I understand it, there's gonna be about $850 million available to be distributed within the counties and cities of that four county region. It will be a competitive program, but there's uh, a lot of flexibility with, with what we're gonna be able to propose. And so, you know, in <coughs> housing plans, um, infrastructure master plans, funding housing trust funds, you know, a, a whole variety of things. And we're just beginning to get our arms around what, what that program is gonna be like. Okay, well thank you for keeping up with the, the challenges ahead and uh, appreciate your work and everybody in the department. Supervisor Caput. Yeah, thank you for your report. And uh, um, I was gonna ask uh, just in general uh, for the public to know, uh, uh, when we're, we, we did things to speed up the process and in the, in the same time for them to get a permit, let's say uh, uh, to do, uh, let's say a half a bath uh, to add to their house. Uh, in general, uh, just a standard uh, request like that, uh, how many permits and how much time would it take them? Do they have to get an architect first to do, draw up a plan? No, if it's a, just remodeling an existing bathroom, you're not relocating or anything, it's, it, that would be the type of thing that I believe we're, you're gonna be able to do uh, through the online permitting program. So you might need a, an electrical or mechanical permit um, because you're gonna need your, your plumbing, your new yeah, plumbing sure. or your new electricity um, inspected. But we don't need a whole plan for it. You know, the bathroom already exists and um, you're just remodeling it, so that would be the type of thing you can go online and apply for the appropriate kind of permits, print it out and start doing the work and then call for inspection when you're ready for your, your, you know, your plumbing and electrical, et cetera, inspection. Right, and, uh, and so how did, how did we make that faster and also uh, uh, maybe a little uh, more cost effective than it was in the past? I think just by what we just mentioned, you'll be able to, you know, any any day and any hour of the day, you'll be able to go online and apply for and pay for and print out a permit. So that's as fast as you can do it, you'll have your permit. Um, and then you can start the work. And so the, uh, we expect, you know, that the cost will go down. The more efficient that we can be, the less it's gonna cost the customer. And I'll note that we have not increased our planning rates in about four years, and that reflects the increasing efficiency with which we're operating. So we're, we're making progress on reducing fees and, and uh, requiring less time to get permits. And uh, who goes on and inspects it as it's being built, for example? Building inspectors. What, what's that? Building inspectors do that work. Okay, yeah. you bet.
Okay. And uh, let's see. Uh, on a renovation, uh, there's a percentage of the, what, what is that percentage on the home that requires less, uh, uh, less, I guess, uh, paperwork? Well, I'm not are you talking about maybe non-conforming structures? Yeah, somebody, uh, in, the, in the past, we raised the percentage of, um, uh, yeah. I'm not sh quite sure what you're, what question you're asking. Okay, um, so if, like, uh, if it's so non-conforming structures, um, it used to be more difficult, especially for commercial properties, um, to remodel and do work on structures that don't comply with current code. And so we changed the way that we measure that several years ago to what's called a major structural components and a more of a whole house <coughs> look at a non-conforming structure. And that has made it um, much more um, feasible to remodel existing non-conforming structures. So that's been in effect for probably about seven or eight this years. Just a few years back, we voted on a percentage, I think, of uh, yeah. value. Uh, for example, somebody's gonna put in all new windows. What percentage is that? It, uh, I don't know, is the roof considered just uh, uh, upkeep or is that a percentage of a renovation? If you're just putting new shingles on, that's not considered a major structural component. So the roof is literally the roof framing that is considered in that calculation. That's pretty much uh, streamlined. Yeah. The roof. Yep. Okay, but if they were going to tear out walls and, uh, you know, that gets more complicated. Then, then yeah. we look at we look at percentages. That's right. All right. Anyway, thank you very much. Sure. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation and the work that's uh, d done all the time. Um, I want to talk about uh, some of the information that that you presented here, which I found very useful to look at those numbers of. Uh, what's coming through the department, Th those would be the kind of great information to actually have in the budget um, uh, 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 to share with us. Um, but one thing I noticed, uh, and you brought up the, the uh, um, this uh, potential staffing issue about code compliance, the number of code compliance issues has dropped uh, uh, significantly. And I'm wondering, what is that a reflection of lack of staffing or is it, better compliance or what do you think that is? So the percentage change, the number in the far right column there is this current year as compared to fiscal year 11-12. Right. And um, that was a year I think that, it was only a year after I got here, but as I recall, there was a fair am amount of purging of cases and that's somewhat related to switching to the new Hansen in four computer system. And um, so we had some really old cases that had been hanging around and, and I think that we 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 stopped those. You know, I, I haven't frankly done a full analysis of, you know, it, it says 920 new cases in 11 and 12 and I'm not quite sure why it was that high. Um, I think these days we're, you know, the compliance by mail in terms of warnings, um, the administrative citation program um, is helping us to uh, induce people to comply more readily rather than have it remain an ongoing, you know, problem. So um, I think that those, that tool has been, has been very effective. And uh, again, having the abatement funds and being able to tackle some of the things on our own that were, that were significant violations that were just hanging out there. So, so that's going on. But, you know, we, we feel good about the, the, the code compliance program. Uh, you know, I will note, you know, that the cannabis licensing office also has two code compliance officers. So that could be some of the reason why our numbers are down because we used to do more cannabis and now they're doing it. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, uh, it's it's the part of the planning department which everybody uh, loves to criticize the planning department until their neighbor starts building something and then they want the, uh, code compliance to come out and then they want us to bring down the hammer of God on them. Uh, and they're always surprised when we can't do it as strongly as they had anticipated. Um, but it'd be, good, it'd be good to know more uh, about that. The um, uh, I'm glad to hear about the e-plan piece. I think that, that that's a, a, 
something that people will find very useful, especially as people increasingly like to do stuff right from the comfort of their home and to be able to print something out. Um, and if we're able to process more applications that way, what, does it create an impact on the inspection staff? And, it could. And how do, you, how do we look yeah, at that? Yeah, it, it could. I mean, um, and, and we're keeping an eye on that. You know, we're, we're fully staffed with building inspectors. We were able to add one new inspector last year. So um, we've got, you know, a fair number of our building inspectors. I think only two of them have been there longer than four years. And but it's a it's a great team. They're efficient, um, and I, I, they're hanging in there. So, but we we will have to keep an eye on that because sure. it you know with the ease of getting a permit, you know, we're hoping that there's less unpermitted activity, and an increase in in requests for building inspection. Um, uh, I also had down here the abatement funds that you talked about. They have been very useful uh, for pr uh, problems, especially in the rural part of uh, my district, to deal with cases. Uh, um, and it seems to me that it's worthwhile for us to have money in that fund because we have some cases where we have to, there's a part, there's, there comes a time in that enforcement process where we have to make sure something gets done. The public expects us to, to get something done. We've identified it as a problem. We've gone to the administrative law judge. You know, we've done everything and still that problem exists in the neighborhood. And having those abatement funds, I think when we put it all together was great. Um, but I think that uh, it's useful to have money in that fund uh, for, uh, to deal with cases, because I'm sure we all have cases. Yeah, we, we agree. And yeah. so we'll be keeping an eye on that. And um, but kudos to Matt Johnson. He's the manager of the uh, code compliance, and Aaron Landry and the rest of the team. They're doing a great job, and uh, especially on those those significant abatements that we hadn't done anything quite like that in quite some time. And yeah. so there's uh, four or five significant projects that have been managed this past year. Yeah, I I, ju I just think it's an important asset that to have. Um, the uh, in looking at the strategic plan goals. Um, it, there, there's a lot of different things um, to, to say something about, but I'll just focus on a few of them. The, uh, the permit center team by December 19 um, is great, and uh, but the one-stop permit center, another 18 month uh, after that, um, it's just, you mentioned that maybe that would be done sooner. That's, uh, th that's, probably the, the number one complaint that we get from uh, people is how long something takes to get through yeah. um, uh, the process. Right. Well, I'll note that, you know, from an operational standpoint in terms of the collaboration and partnerships with, their, with the other agencies and working on streamlining, that's going on right now. So we're trying to view ourselves as a single team. And um, the, the Primo Pi exercise has broken down silos. That was really helpful um, for people to dive in and get to know better what each of the other agency partners do. And, and um, you know, we're really looking at every aspect of it and trying to get everybody on the same page with, even with regard to what's considered a completeness comment, what's a compliance comment, what's gonna be a condition, and when do we have to raise all these issues, and do we have to raise them all you know, right up front, because that can be pretty imposing for some applicants. Um, but you know, we're, so we're operationally, we're moving toward a one-stop shop. It's just the physical manifestation of a space you know, being rebuilt and, um, that's gonna take a little bit longer. Um, if we're gonna do it, we wanna do it right. Sure. Uh, well, in, in, in many of these uh, strategic plan goals, there are some ambitious uh, timelines. And I know that this time next year, we'll be looking, sort of diving down a little bit more deeply I into all those pieces. And uh, I look forward to that discussion across uh, all of our departments. But I particularly just wanna uh, mention that if, that we have other times of the year in which we talk about budget. And um, in November, we'll talk about it before the process starts and in February. And if you're uh, sensing that um, resources are needed to complete these, there, there are so many here <clears throat> that are important um, that I, it, it would be great to, to raise a hand then so we know and not just have to wait 12 months to, f to figure out that we're behind. I think it would be, it would be great. It, it would help you out. It would help the community out, definitely help this board out. Um, and I look forward to that continued discussion. Okay, thank you. 
Supervisor Friend. Thank you, Chair. Again, also thank you for the presentation, the work of your team. A lot of this has been happening in my district, and so I know that we've uh, had a lot of uh, work with your department as well as with Public Works this year on making sure that some of these projects get seen through. The degree by which uh, that can become a one-stop process would also make sense for us as well. I mean, as it stands now, we sometimes even get confused of where something is caught up in. The developer or the applicant doesn't necessarily know. They just send something into a system. They're, they're asked to navigate a confusing system, and I think that um, it is sometimes hard for us to be able to explain to the applicant uh, timelines or why one thing was returned in three days and another took 29 days. And so the degree that by which uh, we have something that even just makes sense and is explainable, I think is helpful. I know that the board is very interested in looking forward to the, the sustainable, both the code mod and sustainable happening in the next, well, I don't want to put a timeline on it, but, but, but uh, at some point in the, in the near future, there, I will say that there are people that are kind of caught in this purgatory interim period right now that are operating, say, especially on the code mod. Um, maybe they've had a long-term bed and breakfast or whatever it may be, and, and it's unclear how, whether they'll fit in the system or not. And so I, what, what I wanted to ask is whether there's ways by which, um, you did work with one business within my district in this regard, but there's ways by which people uh, can get some sort of clarity in the interim in advance of the board action, because right now, uh, what we don't want is code enforcement on something that's been a historic use, even though it may fall out of it with the code mod, but I want some sort of clarity for some of these businesses in the interim. What would be a process that they would take? Uh, you know, we, we have use permit, pr it depends on which aspect you're ask, asking about. If it's, if it's commercial weddings on residential properties not associated with a bed and breakfast, that's probably the one that's li least clear because the, our current code does not you know, it only has the home occupation regulations. Right. But that is the path that's available, is home occupation regulations. Um, we're, we understand that, that your board is not excited about that, and we've had, so, you know, some applicants n not be successful in taking that path. And so we, if we get interest, we, we explain the risk to some of the, the uh, potential applicants. But in terms of bed and breakfast, you can apply. That's a that's basically a conditional use permit with a zoning administrator hearing. You can amend um, existing permits if you're wanting to expand the nature of what you do or the frequency or the hours or what have you. That there's an amendment process that's available. Okay, uh, thank you. In regards to housing, we've made a lot of strides. We're nowhere near where we need to be. The state isn't anywhere near. And actually, the country isn't anywhere near where they need to be. I actually um, was thinking about more of our zoning structure. We're obviously doing something throughout with the Sustainable Santa Cruz to encourage development on spe specific areas. Um, and I appreciate the work on the farm worker housing. Realistically, a lot of this is just uh, what the state's already mandating that we do and, and providing a framework for it. Have we ever, when we, there was a lot of pushback on the state proposal, Senator Wiener's bill specifically on zoning. Um, I mean, I understand it. I live in a single family zoned area. But there's also a history of redlining of districts that created these single family areas, which we don't really talk about for some reason. And I was wondering whether or not um, we as a, as a county or the planning department have ever looked at the historical maps and tried to do a sense of an overlay of how our zoning is compared to where we used to have uh, in this county, directly discriminatory zoning policies, as a way to help explain to the community of why things are the way they are and how things could probably change through zoning shifts. Have we done any historic work that way? Well, you know, it's, it's certainly something that we talk um, a lot about, and we know that there, in our community, that there are areas that um, where zoning was used as that tool. Those, as you know, s gradually over time, that's changed. Um, where we've really focused is how is it that we can create the variety of housing types? And I know you hear us talk about that a lot, but it really is, in if in only allowing single family to be built, um, that inherently, um, because it's the most expensive form of housing, provides a discriminatory framework. Um, so we are very aware of that, and of course we've been working towards kind of a gradual change of within the community of to the point of acceptance of a greater variety of housing types. 
I mean, we've done it with ADUs. We, we've, had, we've built around the, sort of the outskirts on parking discussions, but I mean, all these are really red herrings for what, I mean, let's yeah. be honest, right? I mean, so we, it, these, these make uh, substantive but not substantial changes in, in the trajectory. And so um, I guess the question is, is once we move forward on the sustainable Santa Cruz, absent state action, although, although I think state action is, is realistic moving mm -hmm. forward, some sort of, of understanding, our county may be exempted on a population side, but maybe not on the transit side with what's coming down with the rail corridor, ironically. Mm -hmm. um, then what are we, are we looking for ways within the single family zoned areas to actually um, provide for some sense of intensification? I, I recognize not a popular stance to take, uh, but realistically, uh, given the history of what created those zones, I think it's, it's, it's an honest look to take uh, within the unincorporated area. Well, as, as part of the code modernization and the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan, we are going to be um, revising, you know, s slightly revising uh, the existing residential zoning districts to clarify them, but uh, there'll be some modest adjustments there, particularly in the small lot single family realm. So right now our development standards, you know, it might be the same density, but the development standards don't very well accommodate small lot single family, so detached single family homes, but just on smaller lots. Um, and, and so that is something that's, that's in the SSEC code mod that, that can help because we do, um, you know, throughout the county here and there, we've, we've got larger existing vacant or underdeveloped lots within single family neighborhoods that could, you know, develop rather than, you know, 10, 12,000 square foot single family lots that could increase and still be detached single family, but could get the numbers up on some of those um, large areas. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Seeing no other questions, let's open it up for public comment. Is there anyone who'd like to sh talk to us today? Seeing none, I'll close public comment to bring it back for deliberation and action. I'll move the recommended action. So we got a motion by Friend and a second by McPherson. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, and thank you for your work, and uh, we're excited for uh, all the happenings yep. down in the planning department. Thank you very much. That brings us uh, to our final item for today, which is to consider the 2019-21 proposed budgets for Public Works, DPW, as outlined in the reference budget documents, and to schedule the continuing uh, agreement list and amendments to the unified fee schedule for final approval on last day budget hearings, June 25th, 2019, as outlined in a memorandum of the Assistant CAO and Director of Public Works. Mr. Machado, thank you for coming. <coughs> thank you. All right, good morning, Chair Coonerty, Board of Supervisors. Yeah. Um, as you introduce me, my name is Matt Machado. I'm Director of Public Works and one of the Deputy CAOs. Um, before I get into the presentation, I think the down? Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, I would like to thank a handful of people that, that made this uh, large lift to create this budget for your review. Uh, start with our Public Works team. We had a number of people involved, uh, including Kim Moore, Steve Wiesner, Kent Edler, Sonia Likens, uh, Betsy Lindbergh, who's since retired, but she was had a hand in it, of course. And then uh, I'd really like to thank our program managers. Uh, it really takes a team to bring all the numbers together, the ideas together, the projects, and so uh, many of those are here today in the audience, and I'd like to thank them. Uh, and then, of course, we couldn't have made this happen without the CAO office. Uh, Trish Daniels is, was very, very instrumental. And then Carlos and the rest of his team have been very supportive. And I, I'd like to thank them uh, publicly because they've done so much good work to, uh, to help bring our public works budget together. Today I will cover um, a handful of items, the overview, accomplishments, uh, some staffing, our budget numbers, uh, operational plan highlights, challenges, risks, opportunities, and of course, end off on recommended actions. So to begin with, a, a bit of an overview on our department. Uh, I'll just highlight a couple of changes for this coming year that we have just recently implemented. If you look at the first column, the administrative services, we've added a box called process improvement. That's not additional staff, that's just an effort to put <coughs> more focus on process improvement. And truly, everything we do is a process, 
And so that means there's opportunity for improvement. So we've tried to identify this as, as a point in our, in our organization where we put more attention to it, and this is the start of that. Uh, under the capital projects, uh, real property is, is relatively new under this category. It used to be under administrative services. Under um, transportation, you'll see fleet management. That used to be under administrative services, and now it's where it, it actually does most of its work uh, with the roads team. It also supports the other operations, such as um, uh, sanitation and our, our landfill recycling operations. So we'll start with accomplishments from our fiscal year 18, 19, and there have been a lot. And a lot of times what you hear from us are our challenges, and we will cover those today, but it's always great to highlight accomplishments because the department really does great work for our community, and, uh, and so we want to highlight a few of those. So this past year, we did complete our Davenport Recycled Water Project. Whoops, sorry, didn't want to do that quite yet. Um, for Freedom, we've actually put a lot of attention there, and we're going to see a lot of this work happen this coming year. Um, this is our sanitation project. This past year, we secured four and a half million dollars in grant funding. Uh, an additional four and a half million will be through loans, which will be paid back by our utility users. <clears throat> this project will go to construction in the summer of 2020, so it's in design today. But uh, we're very happy to have funding in place and our finance plan ready to go. The uh, third item is the Trimbley pump station. This is also in Freedom, and we expect completion uh, this summer. So that's quite exciting for uh, the Freedom area. Some additional accomplishments, and uh, Supervisor McPherson, you mentioned the Felton Library, which we're just as excited about it. Uh, it's well underway. We expect completion at the end of this calendar year, which means that uh, early in 2020, we should be occupying it and using it, and, and uh, very excited about that. One additional item I'd like to mention about the Felton Library is that we are coordinating a road resurfacing program in that area for 2020. So we'll have a new library, and then in the summer of 2020, as part of Measure D, we'll be resurfacing those area roads. So we'll have a really fresh look with new crosswalks and new striping to accommodate the new library. So pretty excited about that. Um, additional accomplishments are the uh, facilities and opportunity study that we completed. Um, the next step for that is to bring an item to your board this next, this coming August to look at our long range master planning and our campus master plans. Uh, but the facilities and opportunity study was the first step. And then, and then one of the improvements, uh, we see this as part of our process improvement was the implementation of, of a new procurement process. We call it CUPCA. And it's a state, um, it's a state program that we've opted into now. It'll become effective July 1. Uh, I will add that this will result in time savings and cost savings. And what we plan for this coming year is to track that, and we will let you know next budget season what kind of savings we actually uh, saw that materialized throughout the year. So we're really excited about CUPCA and the new streamlining of Chair, our procurement Chair, I have process. a quick question on that, Mr. Machado. What, yes, sir. what defines a small public project dollar amount? So uh, the current law is less than 200,000, has a streamlined procurement process. It uh, doesn't mean we don't bring items to the board, it just means that we can streamline the bidding process. It's a right. more informal process. And does, would that apply then for CSAs that are looking to do small projects? Yes. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Thank yep. you. Everybody benefits. Yep. Some additional accomplishments. Uh, we talked a bit about the continuous process improvement team. Uh, we've automated a handful of uh, areas. Um, and you can see here electronic invoicing for grant funds, uh, automated construction, uh, project bidding, tracking, and then uh, improved contract processing, which has saved us um, uh, about two weeks, which is great for considering the number of contracts that we implement throughout the year. Additionally, some accomplishments that we're very proud of are our investment in our fleet. Uh, this past year, we procured over $2 million in heavy equipment for landfill and uh, an additional $1.5 million for our, our um, DPW roads operation. I will add that um, our fleet operation is under relatively new management. Uh, they're very data-driven. Um, they have a, a serious focus on, a, on equipment use because the way the equipment is used in our department is that the more we use it, the lower the rates can go. 
and the lower the rates go, then the more we can rent it out, get more work done, which is a real bonus, and then we can keep the equipment fresh and new as well. So continuing on with accomplishments, uh, we'll look at some of our road operations. Uh, this past year, we completed nine storm damage projects with 40 additional in, uh, in phase of development. We completed two and a half miles of overlay projects, and we completed our 2018 Measure D, which was about six and a half miles of county roads resurfaced. Uh, additionally, we completed our pavement condition survey, which we gave you a presentation in, I believe it was February. Uh, I will add on to this, and this seems like an appropriate time. These are the accomplishments of the past, but we never lose sight of the future. <clears throat> and so the coming future for 2019 Measure D is an additional six miles of resurfacing. And uh, that project is uh, anticipated to start construction here in about three weeks. So I thought it would be appropriate to mention today because it's so near term. Uh, additionally, in 2019, we will be uh, programming our expanded um, RSTP, the STVG uh, funding for our uh, federal aid resurfacing program. And I'd like to thank uh, your entire, this entire board for your support at the RTC. Uh, recently, that Can is, I just uh, interrupt one. Uh, is that uh, sorry again? Uh, do those projects that you want to start right in three weeks? Do they have to be done by October or November because of environmental issues or anything like that? Or well, it's best to have them done before the winter season. It's hard to do some of the paving and striping in the winter months. So the goal is to summertime get them done. Absolutely. <clears throat> so let's let's dig into <laughs> into the budget, into the actual numbers. And so we tried to keep this slide as clear as can be, and I will uh, try to explain the differences. And I think that's the key. You know, as we move through budgets, uh, there's status quo, but then when there's changes, it's, it seems to be appropriate to highlight what those changes are. And so the first column under administration, uh, you see a, a change of about a million eight. And I will tell you the, the, there's three components that's driving that change, that increase. First would be the cost of staffing with benefits and salaries. Um, it is a status quo staffing this year. I'll get to that, that's an additional slide. But uh, there is some additional costs due to benefits and salaries. Uh, there are some additional costs uh, due to uh, overhead charges um, from the county level. And then there's also um, an increase in expenditures through our CSAs, and that's driven by the, the community themselves, the CSA uh, members. Under transportation, you actually see a decrease, a $20 million decrease in budget. Now remember, these are budgeted items. These aren't actuals yet. Uh, so in transportation, we're trying to take a more um, accurate direction with our budget in transportation. So that decrease of $20 million is primarily due to storm damage projects. And we're trying to budget the maximum local match that we have available. And so we don't want to budget more than we can match. Um, it doesn't mean that we're doing less work. I would actually say that we're proposing to do more work this year than what we've been able to in the past because we brought on more consultants and we're getting more streamlined internally with delivering projects. So just because you see a reduction in budget doesn't mean we're doing less work. I would argue that we're probably going to be able to do more work this year. We're just budgeting more accurately to the, to the level of match that we can, we can manage. In the special services column, uh, you see an increase of about $10 million, and this is primarily due to our Freedom Sewer Project. This is a pipeline rehab project, the one I mentioned earlier where we had a $4.5 million grant and about a $4.5 million loan, so that's driving that number. Uh, the overall department total, when you add them all up, is about uh, a reduction of about $8.5 million. This slide just shows the, the status of our, fund, of our staffing for the year. Uh, it is a status quo. We are not proposing to add any staff members, and so we're holding to our existing um, staffing level, uh, so no change from fiscal year 1819. So here is our um, second year of the budget, this is a two-year budget, the 2020-2021. Uh, I will just briefly comment on some of these changes. And so when we look at administration and there's a reduction in budget, um, 
This is really primarily due to CSAs. And so CSAs drove some of the budget up this year and next year uh, we budgeted them back to almost like a zero point because we don't have their numbers yet. And so I suspect that as we get closer to the 2020, 2021, that some of those numbers may change. But at this point, our best guess is to, is to reduce their budget uh, based upon um, the current year. Under transportation, uh, the reduction in 2021 is due to completed projects. And so we have a number of bridges that are proposed to be completed and resurfacing projects to be completed. So a reduction for, for that category. And special services, the, uh, the, the driving force here again is the Freedom Project. We will have it budgeted and, and possibly complete, but if not, we'll roll it forward and, uh, and you'll see that reflected in the update for the, for the next year's budget. Uh, also, uh, the fixed asset budget is, is down a bit in special services um, because of the budgeting purpose there. So that's the 2021 uh, proposed budget. So next I will cover our operational plan highlights and this is what you've heard a lot from all the other departments about the countywide strategic plan and how we uh, propose to operationalize that plan. For public works, we actually have 19. Let me just say that, that photo, I've never seen a more beautiful treatment pond <laughs> in my entire life. Isn't that great? <laughs> <coughs> I agree. <laughs> Maybe you should make a book of them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so for public works, we do have 19 objectives. I don't plan to cover them all, but we certainly could talk to them all if you like. Um, in this presentation, I have identified six of them that I'd like to highlight. And so we'll go through those individually. Uh, there's actually two slides of, of these operational um, highlights. The first one that you see here is uh, under our focus area of reliable transportation. The strategy for this first one is that we will implement timely quality repairs to increase road resiliency along critical evacuation um, corridors. Now, all of our objectives are to be completed by June of 2021. We held consistent with the two-year time frame, And so you can see that that first one is an effort to increase our storm damage site repairs. The next two go a, a bit of hand in hand. They're under our focus area of sustainable environment. Uh, the strategy for both of these next two is we will advance policies and programs to protect and promote environmental stewardship and sustainability. Uh, the first one is our recycling and solid waste. Uh, really focused on organic waste diversion. The second one there is our sewer upgrades, um, trying to lift the moratorium in the uh, Rodeo Basin. And then the last one on this page uh, is back on our focus area of reliable transportation under the strategy of we will prioritize local road projects based on daily usage and safety to efficiently maintain the county road network. Uh, you see that we are targeting 25 miles over the, the two-year time frame. We do believe that's a stretch goal. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Measure D is about six miles a year. Uh, we're hopeful that RSTP can make up the balance, most of that balance, but, but remember these are stretch goals. So uh, we're shooting for 25 and uh, we hope we get there. We will work hard to get there. So the next operational uh, plan highlights I'd like to uh, bring to your attention. The first one is again under our, um, our reliable transportation. Under the strategy, we will improve traffic flow to reduce intra-county travel times. Uh, data is really important when looking at uh, roadways and trying to come up with solutions. Uh, we haven't had that program in the past, and so this would be a new traffic count program that we are implementing. <clears throat> The second item there is for our uh, zone five. Uh, this is under the focus area of sustainable environment. The strategy is we will work with partner agencies, private water users, residents, and the agricultural community to sustainably manage water resources to meet human and environmental needs. Uh, and as we've talked in the past, zone five with the uh, master plan will lead us into an improved CIP, capital improvement program, uh, will lead us into an impact fee program where development will pay its fair share in a streamlined fashion. Uh, so this is a, a great operational goal and uh, we're excited about 
about that item. And then the last one is not a part of the county strategic plan, but it's important and I wanted to highlight it to your board. It is critical to our operations and delivery of services and this is back on <clears throat> the fleet side of our operations. Um, and I'll mention it again. We have proposed and are planning to uh, put our fleet into its own internal service fund into a dedicated ISF and that will create fiscal protections and provide better focus on equipment needs and operations. So we're excited about that one. So even though we have a number of accomplishments and goals going forward, there are always challenges and risks. And so uh, we'll go through those. To begin with, our storm damage recovery. Uh, and you've heard me talk a lot about this, so I, I don't wanna overdo it. Uh, but, the, but the hot items, of course, are the funding gaps. Uh, that 5.7 million in that first uh, bullet are, are monies that were actually spent during the 2017 event and that we were not able to secure reimbursement for, so that is a funding gap. Uh, you've seen that we have a proposal in the supplemental today, and uh, it's a good proposal. It cures this funding gap, uh, but it's not without pain, of course, and so um, thank you for considering that. The second item is a recent loss of federal highways funds. Uh, this is due to the time extension from the March 2016 storms. We are working diligently and uh, with a number of your board members, thank you for your assistance, pushing the federal legislation to, to stop this risk in the future, but the 2.2 is real and uh, it is monies that have been lost and we are working on a plan to implement those critical facilities without federal highway assistance. And then the third item is a future risk, uh, the $35 million risk of more than 77 projects. We do have a meeting tomorrow with Federal Highways in Sacramento. We're really hoping to get some guidance from Federal Highway staff so that when we submit our time extension that we could secure a yes versus a no. Uh, in addition to our legislative efforts which are ongoing, uh, I'd like to thank Supervisor Friend for pushing the NACO element with that resolution. Uh, Supervisor McPherson for reaching out to a number of his contacts um, in the legislation to get some attention. There's a number of bills being pushed today to, to hopefully resolve these risks, but for today, it's still a risk. Uh, secondly, on the page, we have deferred maintenance challenges and risks, and this is uh, ongoing and it's well known uh, the road side of our, our operation, we have a $240 million deferred maintenance. Uh, on culverts, we have a $50 million deferred maintenance. Culverts will be a focus in these coming years to identify how we prioritize those needs. We know the needs are huge. We certainly can't get to them all at once, but if we can prioritize and start chipping away at it, it will protect us in the future. So that is our plan, and of course, uh, aging and, and uh, aging equipment and facilities. We've talked a bit about the facilities, um, or about the equipment, the facilities. Uh, all of our facilities average age is 45 years, so it's time to start investing and planning and looking in that. And I did mention the long range facilities plan, which will include those facilities. Continuing on with challenges and risks uh, in our solid waste area, we have a number of challenges coming in the near future. The first one is our transfer station needs. Uh, as the landfill becomes full, which we still think it has about 10 years of life, and we hope to say that for quite a few more years coming forward by recycling, by diverting, uh, we'd like to keep our landfill open, but we certainly do need to plan and move forward with the new transfer station. We estimate a 15 to $20 million expense. Our number one uh, location for this new transfer station will be at our Buena Vista landfill. Additionally, our organics uh, facility and organics in general, uh, there is a state legislation that requires us, and mandates us to be in compliance by 2021, which means that we'll be collecting organics from our customers. And to do that, we need to have a facility in place. Uh, we are looking at a combined composting organics facility. Uh, we're looking at um, bringing that together, hopefully in the area of the Buena Vista landfill. Our number one alternative site today is on top of the old landfill. Uh, if you've been down there, there's a, a large area. It looks suitable. So we are doing conceptual design today. 
And then finally, some additional challenges and risks continue in the Davenport area. Uh, due to the size of the, the community, uh, they still struggle with high rates and, and needs that they can't um, necessarily afford. Uh, we're hopeful that as new development occurs down in that or up in that area, that that will support the utilities and the community's uh, utility rates. And then also drainage uh, continues to be a challenge, uh, a huge risk. Uh, zone five is the, uh, the center point of that. Uh, we also are looking at zone six, which has similar needs. And so we're looking at um, opportunities for additional funding through assessments and impact fees, which would mitigate the new development in those areas. <clears throat> I will uh, move into some opportunities, which is, which is a good way to finish, I would say, instead of le leaving you on such a sour note. Some of the uh, highlighted opportunities include flood control uh, down in zone seven in the Pajaro uh, River area. We are looking at a JPA, which would be a, a great um, opportunity for us in, with new finance options. And then of course the long range facilities and camper, campus master planning, making best use of county asset, assets in a planned and programmed way so that we could make the most out of those assets I mentioned earlier that we did complete the Opportunities and Challenges study. Uh, your board accepted that study April, this past April. Going forward, the county has proposed about a half a million dollars per year for the next two years to implement this uh, major effort. We do plan to bring a contract to your board in August for your consideration. And then finally, uh, a great opportunity will be the Rule 20A uh, Utility Undergrounding Program. We think that there's real opportunity here. We currently have a fund balance in that program of about 18 million with PG&E. Historically, we've used it for urban commercial zones. Uh, we'd like to uh, see those funds put onto major evacuation corridors where we could get uh, more improvement for less money on these long corridors up in the mountainous areas. So we're working directly with Caltrans, I mean with PG&E to get that in writing that we can implement that. And uh, so we're excited about that opportunity. With that, I will turn to our recommendations. Our recommended action this morning is to consider approval of the 2019-2021 proposed and supplemental budgets for the Department of Public Works as outlined on pages 281 to 310 and 642 to 648 and pages 43 to 48 of the supplemental and to schedule the proposed continuing agreements list items and amendments to the unified fee schedule for final approval on last day budget hearings, June 25th, 2019. And with that, I can answer any questions you may have. All right, any questions? Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, thank you for the presentation and thank you for the work of the, uh, all the staff who works every day to, the, to uh, support the infrastructure of our county. Um, we, we see during storm periods how uh, um, the staff rallied uh, to keep roads open, but uh, just regular day to day, um, whenever there's an issue, I know our staff uh, contacts Augie or other members of the road crew. They're there to help um, the, the, the ongoing drainage and culvert uh, work, uh, cleaning and uh, trimming and all that stuff uh, makes a huge difference in the day-to-day -day life of people uh, who uh, travel on our roads, especially on our, on our rural communities. Um, uh, the, uh, you, uh, you've landed in a position during a terrible time where we have a federal administration who doesn't seem to really want to help California during a disaster. I'm glad to see that the, this plan to try to backfill um, uh, the money that, we've, uh, that we had to spend uh, but couldn't uh, uh, submit any applications for and then the money in which we're being denied uh, through the federal highway. Um, it's, uh, I think we have to do it and we're gonna, we're, I think we're gonna have to put more money into infrastructure over time uh, because I'm, I, I'm, I'm unclear that that $35 million um, disaster that's waiting for us is gonna be resolvable, uh, but we don't seem to have an administration who's interested in actually resolving it in, in any way. Um, that said, when I look at the, uh, the strategic goal about 25 miles, in, in a normal situation that seems to be a stretch, but in 
this situation, it seems even more of a stretch because we're borrowing from the funds that we'd be used to do. And if this year all we're getting done in terms of road resurfacing is a measure D, and that's, that's about six or seven miles, and even if we get additional half million dollars from RSTP, I just don't see how we get to 25 in two years. Yeah. Um, do you have a sense about that? Sure. So um, the Measure D is accurate. We believe the RSTP uh, could potentially nearly match the, those mileages of Measure D. And so the 25 is over two years, so that's 12 miles a year. So with our six miles, we're halfway there. It is a stretch. Uh, but we believe with RSTP funding and us continuing to pursue other funds, uh, we could potentially get to the to the 12 and a half per year. We know it's a stretch. Uh, f you know, for instance, this year we're not going to quite get there. But we have a, a bigger program scheduled next year for the RSTP funding, and so we're still optimistic that we can get there. Uh, and if we don't get there exactly, we'll be really close. Great. And and that's mission accomplished in our minds. Yeah. Um, the, the, the restriping, uh, mm -hmm. it looks like this is a plan that by 2023, all county roads will be restriped. Is, is, does that seem accurate? That's correct. That is correct. Um, that's also, it's, it's an important uh, and often overlooked piece, but as soon as they get restriped, people notice um, what they were missing. Um, the, I, I was trying to uh, match up two of the strategic goals one was, was uh, goal 30, 134, which was looking at uh, the congestion in Soquel, and there it defined the area between Soquel Drive from 41st to Main Street. And then uh, the bus priority thing of on, um, on, go on the strategic uh, uh, goal on number 151, which looks at a much longer piece. Now, part of this seems to me to be synchronization of lights and everything, and I'm just wondering why we aren't looking at these in toto instead of breaking it off into these two pieces. So um, they are relatively independent. So the first one is really a focus on the signal at Robertson Road and working on the village itself, trying to improve. That's clearly the bottleneck. But the secondary one, working with the synchronization and the signals and working with Metro, uh, you probably know that Metro is working on improving their technology on their buses, their sure. automated vehicle locating, the AVL systems, and we would like to integrate that information with our signal work so that as the buses are coming through the corridor, uh, our signals can actively identify them and try to shave a second here or there. They catch the red and just trying to make more improvements for the transit side of the world. It does two things. It, first of all, clearly would, could reduce congestion by promoting the use of the buses. It also would bring a partner in to secure more funding for that corridor to continue to improve it. So we'd like to keep them separate because they're really separate initiatives with separate um, project goals. Great. Thanks for clarifying that. I appreciate it. Um, the, uh, the capital improvement plan goal uh, to uh, for compliance with state regulations. Um, that's the first time I ever heard that we had to have a CIP uh, compliant with state regs. Uh, I know we've done some work to change, this is item uh, number 139. And I'm trying to figure out what's deficient in our CIP that doesn't meet state regulations. Hmm. It's okay, you can phone a friend. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little unfamiliar too with it. I wonder who would be best. <laughs> Let us get back to you on that one. Okay, then, all right. <laughs> I'm not trying to stump you, I'm just. <laughs> um, on uh, 144 is the one about the Live Oak parking program. And I thought that we were trying to have the Live Oak parking program uh, reconfigured for next summer, but it says June 2021. And I'm just, uh, it was, is there a reason, is there something I'm not thinking about? Well, so fully implemented would be that would be completely operational. Uh, we would have all the, the details worked out. We are pursuing it today even. In fact, we plan to submit to, um, through our planning department for the permit uh, in the month of July. 
Uh, but we know that's gonna take time to get the permit, to get everybody on the same page, and then to implement with getting the signage up and to expand the program itself. Um, so we believe that it will take a bit of time, but you will see that new program in place next year, but it'll take a year to work out the details and okay. the, the bugs of it. Great. Um, I was excited to see is one of the um, strategic goals about the rail trail and uh, public works. And um, I know we've there's been some grant funding to get uh, design work done on segment nine. And I'm wondering if you could get sense of what might happen on, on that segment by June 2021. That's the Seabright to 17th Avenue. Right, segment. so segment nine is mostly under the city's jurisdiction and then the tail end of it is in the unincorporated area. Um, I don't know that I have a really great sense, but the, the goal is that, that just as the city has implemented segment seven and they continue to move our direction, um, the plan is that we will follow in right behind them with our environmental work, our full design, and hopefully it gets implemented on a similar schedule. Okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to keep in contact with you to see how we move that uh, one along. It'll be sounds great. Um, it's going to be great when it's uh, when it's ready and done. Yes. Um, the the last one uh, I wanted to ask about is more of a larger goal. We have this goal about uh, reducing waste um, and encouraging recycling, and then I think about our recent actions to close the CR. The, mm -hmm. the CRV or the CR, what, what do we call those? CRV. The, the CRV. Um, uh, locations in the San Lorenzo Valley. And I'm trying to think, how, what are we doing to, to meet that goal? There, there, there's, there's something general about plastic pollutions, and I uh, want to recognize Tim Goncharoff for, for helping us uh, strategize on some uh, ideas. But I'm a little worried about the, what you've shared with us about um, the challenges of recycling, how, how we're gonna actually make this all happen. So we know that um, our best opportunity for, for recycling is, is as a larger unit through green waste is a really great option. Um, as we can, if we can collect it at, say, through the uh, transfer station of Buena Vista landfill, we have a greater chance of doing more recycling through our, our waste hauler. They have the best connections in that area. And so to speak to the CRV, that wasn't getting us where we needed to go and it had a cost. So it was a subsidized cost that didn't really get us to the recycling goals that we needed to. Uh, in terms of the, gr the greater picture, you know, that's getting more to the, you know, the organics and composting facility that will lead us to less waste in our landfills. Currently the organics are primarily going to the landfill and so Improving those streams will, will better our program as well. Yeah, I think when we talk about a, a goal that says we will pursue policies and programs to encourage recycling and waste reduction, you know, it's, yeah. we have to figure out how we encourage that recycling. If we're, we're, we're sending some mixed messages, uh, and I'm just, sure. for us to be thinking strategically about what, um, how we share with the public what we want them to do, right? We, right. we said we want them to recycle everything, and now there are jurisdictions who are saying, don't recycle that plastic, don't recycle this plastic. Um, and so it, it's, it's not as simple as it was in the past. It's gonna require us to be much more sophisticated in order to get people uh, to continue to do um, work. And then we're gonna have to, as, a, as the Board of Supervisors may need to enact policies that reduced waste mm -hmm. um, on the front end rather than having it come through the waste stream as we do now. So. We agree and thank you for your comment. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, thank you very much, and thank you for all the efforts that you and the Public Works Department take. Uh, I know when we call with some emergencies, uh, you, re you write on it as quickly as you can be, and it's difficult to see with the magnitude of the damage we've had in our roads that people, uh, or many of our citizens just say, I need it fixed uh, now or yesterday. And uh, I think when you explain the magnitude, again, to you that word of our damages and uh, the question marks we have in the reimbursement from the federal government, um, they understand it better. But thank heavens to the voters who approved Measure D that we're able to do as much as we can at this point. Uh, with with the to follow up on the landfill with the organics, and it's a six to eight million a dollar cost possibility, and it's, I think it's, is that gonna be state supported? I mean, they, or is this an unfunded mandate of sorts? Um, 
that cost? Well, it's my understanding that it's pretty much an unfunded mandate. Um, I can certainly have staff speak to that if, if you want to hear more details about those opportunities, but for the most part, unfunded that's, mandate. Uh, okay, that's not unusual, I guess. Uh, but, and I, I really, <laughs> it happens all the time, unfortunately, um, but less, to a lesser extent than maybe years past. But uh, the, I, I really want to say, um, I really appreciate your targeting the $240 million for culverts and deferred maintenance. I mean, for along a, 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 an important stretch like Highway 9, that's really critical because we have a slip out there and it's a nightmare, as we know, because there's a cliff on one side and a canyon on the other for the most part. So um, I do appreciate um, your designating some funding for that. Um, we. Um, um, on, uh, well, we've talked about the Federal Highway Administration and FEMA and all, and with those reimbursements and how critical they are. Uh, it's, that's another point that we need to make that uh, we've done this work and really we're promised uh, an ex time extension to get the reimbursement for it, but uh, now they're backtracking on that. So uh, we'll continue to work on that. I appreciate your support. I'm anxious to hear what your, the response is from uh, the Federal Highway Administration this week. Um, and to follow up on the, the recycling, uh, there was those, uh, the, the funding of the cycling, the recycling centers, uh, particularly in my district, um, that saved about $250,000. Was that just part of the budget or is that, is that spelled out anywhere in particular, that, that savings, or is it just, hey, we don't have that $250,000 to think about and we'll just build the budget from here? Right, so um, it's not, uh, explicitly spelled out, but I can show or yeah. tell you uh, where those funds are going in general. And so when we talk about the um, organics and compost facility, we're working on conceptual design. And so we're spending money on that. Uh, additionally, at the Buena Vista landfill, we've had some issues with the, the flare. And so we are designing and implementing uh, an additional flare to stay in compliance. And so in general, as, as we see savings in one area, we also see increased expenses in other areas. And so the money is just being budgeted for those, for example, those two, mm -hmm. those two areas. Okay. And I, on the uh, CRV, and I've gotten some concerns uh, from uh, residents in the San Lorenzo Valley that they don't have their, their uh, mm -hmm. drop-off sites in Boulder Creek and Felton now. And I know that we have, with the leadership of uh, Supervisor Friend and myself writing a letter to the state uh, to try to address this issue to uh, alleviate that concern and cost for uh, merchants. Uh, has there been any, do you know of any action on this? I don't at this point, but... Uh, I think it'd be something that we should really take a serious con a look at to see if the state can help us out and, and well, everybody throughout uh, the state, as a matter of fact, in uh, addressing that issue. Yes, we're, at, we're watching it. We're, we're hoping that there's opportunities out there for some of the CRV recyclers that still exist, but there's been a huge reduction in, in those agencies and those groups, those nonprofits. Uh, I think the last number I heard, there was a reduction of over 1,000 of those CRV oh. Uh, sites. Nonprofit sites in the state have been reduced. There's still a couple in the area, so we're somewhat maybe glimmer of hope that, that something still happens and we're watching the state level as well. Yeah, I, I don't think, I'm not passing, passing the blame on the state or any, uh, but I wish, I hope that they can step up. Um, this is uh, an issue, the recycling market just collapsed literally uh, over the last couple of years and um, we need to have a better resolution, but it's gonna have to come from the state, I think, and so I'd like to see us continue with that effort. Okay, will do, thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Caput. How you doing? Great, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, all of you, uh, for what you're trying to do. Uh, it seems like, <clears throat> it looked like we were gonna have extra money because of uh, Measure D and all that. Uh, but then, of course, we had the uh, the highway money, uh, federal highway money. It's uh, in the uh, presentation. It says 2.2 million. It, it. I thought it was the figure was actually about seven or eight million. But is it just one specific area? Or? So the two point <clears throat> the 2.2 million is referenced to just the time denial for the March of 2016 storms. <clears throat> the 5.7 is funds that we expended during the 2017 
uh, storm event. So you add them together, that's when you get to that seven, eight million dollar mark. Right. And so they're, they're separate, but then together that's how you get to the larger number. Okay, somehow we're gonna have to make up that five point, uh, uh, five million, <clears throat> that five million though, right? Somewhere, not necessarily just your department, but somewhere. Right, so, so as part of the supplemental uh, budget item, we do have a proposed plan where uh, it's an internal uh, loan and repayment schedule. So we hope we have a solution for that. And that plan includes uh, most of the 2.2 so that we can implement projects this coming year. Uh, there's some carryover the next year we'll have to, we'll have to um, figure out which projects can go to construction and how we fund those. But most of it is in that supplemental item uh, that'll solve the five seven and the and most of the two million dollar okay. loss. And then on the uh, sidewalk uh, the work that's being done on 152, uh, now Caltrans is are they paying for some of that or are we paying for the? Is that at the uh, it's which from Wagner to Houlihan on Highway 152? It's all Caltrans. So yeah, that that is all Caltrans. It's all Caltrans. So we're okay there. Right. All right, and then I guess uh, what I'll ask is too, I, it, um, I'm kind of trying to nudge it forward, uh, the, the intersection Houlihan and uh, College and 152, and uh, it kind of keeps uh, getting bumped down the road. So uh, I, th I think we're close to getting there though, but let me go ahead and explain sure. that. Sure, so we are wrapping up the design and uh, the right of way needs that we have, construction easements and the such. And so being shelf ready, we believe we will uh, compete better for competitive funds. And so we think we're, we're getting closer to realization of that project. Uh, I don't believe it would happen this summer, this construction season. We're really targeting next season because we'll have a fully designed, fully implementable, ready to list project. So our target is next year. We still do need to secure the, the final money for that project. Okay, and when we say final money, we're short about how much? It was a million, about a million dollars, just over a million. But we have a lot of that, right? Because we're not no, short. No, no, we're short the mil we're short a million. A little over a million dollars is our short amount. So it's still, but if we become shelf ready, we think we can secure those funds. So we're gonna keep working okay. on it. We'll keep you updated we, we, as we, we go. Uh, well, I guess what I'm getting at is we have secured some of that. So the total secured. project cost is two and a half? Yep, around two and a half to three. Two and a half to three million is a total project cost. So we have secured everything except about a million, a little more okay. than a million. All right. Right. And then uh, let's see, what do we got? Uh, Oh, the, the landfill. Um, I, I, China's putting a lot of pressure on this. They used to take a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of recyclable or even uh, garbage. So uh, how much pressure is that putting on us now that they're, that they're not taking as much? They're turning back uh, what they used to, they're not turning all of it back, but they're turning back a significant amount. Well, it's certainly a moving target, and it's a very dynamic um, market that, that we're a part of. Um, I, th I would say we're fortunate to have Green Waste as our partner on this. Uh, they have access to markets that we certainly wouldn't have, nor would our individual uh, constituents have, so we're fortunate to have them. Um, I do think that pressure from, from the worldwide uh, market is is creating opportunities domestically. So it's hard to say exactly how it's going to, to work itself out, but I think um, as challenges occur, opportunities are also created. So we're just gonna keep a close eye on it and know that Green Waste is, is doing the best they can do with the resources and connections that they have. Okay, when, uh, I guess the other would be a little follow up. And uh, we send over recycled uh, material and then uh, if it's rejected, um, I think they, they have a term for it, if it's too dirty or too wet or um, I guess we're talking about, you know, uh, if it's not cleaned out somewhat, uh, the recycle. When that comes, does that come directly back to Santa Cruz County or does it go to, go to some huge junkyard somewhere? 
So it, it doesn't come back to directly to Santa Cruz County, but I was looking for Tim or um, yeah. maybe Casey. We could talk more about it. Yeah, I'm just curious. I, I mean, I, it seems I, I would, of coming back. Captain. No, 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 no. That's not how it would work. But I will add before Casey uh, speaks to your question. Um, there's always an education piece that is needed, you know, in terms of keeping our recyclables clean. You know, that is a big item, of course. And so we can continue to educate our, um, our customers. But in terms of the material that is rejected, I guess, Casey, do you have a thought on that? Yeah, if we were to come back, uh, Green Waste would take that and have either try to clean it up and recycle it again, or it would have to go to a landfill. So it actually is targeted and it comes back uh, to Santa Cruz County. Well, Green Waste may have a broker who loads it in a sea container, ships it over to China. They reserve the right to reject that material if okay. it's not clean enough, and then it would get sent back. And I'm not sure if Green Waste would actually handle it again or the broker would you know, take care of that. Okay. It's a little more strict now than it was, though. Definitely. Okay. And then I guess while you're up, uh, too, uh, there seems to be a trend in some places. It, it goes either way, uh, with natural gra uh, grass or... Uh, artificial turf. Uh, the, the natural grass, uh, some people are uh, actually taking out artificial turf, putting that back in because the injuries and stuff like that are fields. But I'm getting what well, the point I'm getting at is uh, artificial turf does have a uh, shelf life, and uh, what it is, when it has to be removed, and I'm talking about football fields, soccer fields, and parks, if we have too much of that. That ends up going to the landfill, right? Uh, correct. There's n no, um, I'm not aware of any way to recycle that other than to reuse it. And then once it gets worn out, I know they, they, they do have to replace the sections. To, yeah, I'm trying to be a little more preventative. Uh, I, when people are pushing uh, in all these parks, not just here, but in different areas, if we get too much of it and that it all uh, wears out at a certain time, then uh, we're going to have a problem on the landfill. That would, that would, it, w it says the a shelf life of our landfill is about 10 years. And, uh, uh, you know, it, if you get a lot of this stuff coming in, that, that could shorten it. Correct. Correct, <laughs> right. And uh, are we looking at uh, buying land around the landfill close by so we don't have to actually move it to some other part of the county? So <clears throat> in terms of the uh, transfer station and the organics <coughs> composting facility, we're trying to keep it on the landfill site itself, on Buena Vista itself, and <coughs> not have to pursue acquisition of, of other lands. We've, we've, we've got a number of alternatives of reusing some of the space I mentioned earlier, uh, using the top of the old landfill, which is a nice flat level surface. Uh, we're looking at conceptual designs to, to carry the load to design a foundation system that would work up there for our compost. And uh, I'll mention that the, uh, com the combined compost organics facility would be undercover, uh, so we could avoid any sort of runoff issues. And so it could be a large, large structure, but it would be on county-owned property. And that's our preference today, is to stay focused on what we own and the assets that we have and, and manage those the way the best way we can. So th that would add to the 10 year, 10 plus or minus years. Well, of course. And so, you right, know, our okay. goal is and has been to uh, keep our landfill open as long as right. possible. Uh, it's, a, it's a real opportunity when we encounter natural disasters, uh, having our own access. And so if we can divert more material out of the landfill, that 10 years, hopefully I keep saying that 10 years for the next number of years. So absolutely, right. that's the goal. Yeah, and I think I think I'm speaking for all of us uh, when we talk when you talk about a new um, uh, a garbage area. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, not, none of us really want it uh, in right in the center of one of our districts. So uh, well, where it is right now, it'd be good if it could you know continue to uh, uh, you know right. be functional. Yeah, currently we don't have an alternative that we're even considering in terms of opening a new landfill in, in Santa Cruz County. That's not one of our options today. Uh, the transfer station would, would allow us to 
take our material somewhere else, say maybe marina or, or another location, or continue to focus on recycling and composting. We think those would be, those are required and, and great opportunities. Yeah, and, and, but then the things change so quick, the, pe the people in marina could say, hey, we're not gonna take it either though. You know, that's what sure. I mean. Absolutely. And when you get that public pressure. Right. And the last one is what I'd really like to see uh, is uh, the cooperation with uh, 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 flood control. And uh, that's what I call preventative maintenance and preventative uh, um, uh, work. And if we spend, you know, like $400 million or whatever on a, a flood control measure for the Pajaro River, uh, it sounds like a lot of money, but it's a lot less than if there's a flood and then FEMA gets involved and that's all taxpayer money. We're talking about much, much more after a flood happens than uh, if we put in money for, uh, you know, preventing, preventing that. Right. We agree and uh, we think our current strategy of possibly building in segments uh, yeah, through right. state subventions will really get us a long ways to uh, implementation with through the JPA. So great yeah, strategy and, uh, coming forward. Uh, maybe I'm simpl simplifying it, but it's um, a federal money that's a hold up right now with the Army Corps. And that's probably uh, half or a little more than half of the money we need out of the 400 million. But if we're able to use the other money we get from the state or local, we're able to actually uh, you know, get get things done, right? And it'll it'll we'll get credit on the on the backside when we do get federal funding in terms of our local match. So it's a win-win. Absolutely, we agree. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. your comment. That uh, that's really exciting because uh, it's a new concept as far as uh, we've been waiting for uh, the Army Corps, and uh, um, this way we could at least start and get going, and then they can they can join us later. Right, you exactly. Bet. And uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, and I'll, I will do another tour. I, I've got potholes that I want all of you to see. Okay, good, thank okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> Supervisor Friend, anything? I, I think I'm good. All right, good. Uh, so let's uh, open it up for public comment. Seeing no one, I'll bring it back to the board. Um, thank you, and I appreciate, let me just say, I appreciate you stre setting stretch goals. Um, you know, I've said in the context of our operational plans, if, if we end up meeting every goal, then, uh, then we didn't do a good job. And so I appreciate that you're willing to, to push and, and try to figure out new and creative ways to deliver services, um, as people have said, even as the uh, feds renege on their, on their obligations to us, we're trying to figure out how to do better for, for the people of Santa Cruz County. Uh, I would move the recommended actions for the Public Works Department. Second. So we got a motion by Leopold and a second by Friend. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we will now recess until 9 a.m. tomorrow morning here in board chambers where we will have our last day of budget hearings.